so this I conference will recording. this conference will now be recorded and okay thank you and if everyone could join us it's slightly awkward online uh, but stick with us. everyone could join us in the pledge of allegiance in, in our first in the diet. i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america, america. To the which stands under god Thank you. So our first agenda item this evening is President of Representatives from Latitude 42 regarding a proposal to locate a medical. Um, again, and I think honestly, we don't want to have to repeat. The guys bring their volume down. That will enable that to work. We'll call our eight example. You turn your phone on mute. The meeting is going to proceed as follows. We are going to have two documents and a presentation for the project proponents, Latitude 42. We will then turn the floor to the town council for a little bit of background. We will then take questions from the board and the staff, followed by questions from the public. We have Seven callers on Hello? the line. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask Hello. all the participants to be online. I don't think you can. Hi, I'm here. I don't know what's going on here. It's kind of like gibberish. I apologize. Callers 42 and callers 42 are on your devices. Okay. There's too many people trying to get in. So again, because of the number of participants, and so that we can have give everyone an opportunity to, to participate. If you are online, there's a chat room there. Maybe you're more to the top right. Oh, maybe. Right. maybe. Oh, maybe. Oh, maybe. You can you can use that chat feature to submit your question. Um, that would be really helpful. Secondly, before speaking, if you can please state your name and address prior to proceeding with your comment or question. I'm going to turn the floor over to any business owners that are currently on the call for the time question comment period is up. I'm also going to ask if there are any condo association representatives able to make a statement or wanting to on behalf of the condo association. I will turn the floor to you. I will turn the floor. Following you, we will turn it over to individual callers. Again, I cannot be stated enough, but you could please put your device on mute. And I'm going to ask everyone to keep your comments to under two minutes so that we give everyone an opportunity um, to either make or ask their questions. I'm going to ask first time speakers to speak. I will not go to a second, your second turn until we've had first comments from first time speakers. And then lastly, as, as I mentioned, we are now up to 134 callers on this, on this um, conference. And I know that this is going to be and has been already a spirited debate. Um, I'm really asking everyone to be respectful and courteous of each other. And those are the ground rules. Um, that last one may be being the most important. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn the, the presentation to Latitude 42. And again, if presenters and rep proponents can introduce yourself, state your name um, and your your title, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman and Constable. Are we able to control the screen so we can share our presentation? Brenna Galvin, 
is the um, individual that has our presentation ready to share. I believe that that you were giving pres presentation uh, right now. Can you just? Yeah, I'm that? just. I'm. I'm going to give it right to Brenna Galvin in one second. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay. So Brenna, Brenna has now been made a uh, presenter, so she should be able to uh, to have control of the screen at this point. Thank you. Hey, Don, it's Sean. Um, the only other thing I'm noticing is that there's people that I can see on the screen who, who are not muted right now. And I, I don't know if there's any way to mute it from the um, from the organizer's side. I'm trying uh, I'm trying to go through individually and mute, but when I did a mute all, it seemed to cut off uh, Jen and others, so I didn't want to do a mute all. So I'm um, trying to manage it individually as best <laughs> yeah, I can. It's hard. But the sound, sound quality has gotten better, I think. Yeah, yeah I, think, well, I see most everybody muted at this point. Okay. All right, so Brenna has the ball. He's having some technical difficulties that we're getting there. Give us one second. I apologize for the delay. Sorry, there's so much. Can I share mine instead? Brenna doesn't have capabilities yet, I don't think. She's having trouble with that. Is there any way to check that? All right. uh, I will check it right now. Thank you. Is uh, Brenna Galvin presenter? Is, is she offline? No. All right. Let's see. I can see her here. Yeah. It says Brenna Galvin, and then it has parentheses off. Uh, oh. Oh, she's she's listed as a presenter, and uh, yep. we're gonna just make. Got, uh, go ahead. You want to try? She. Uh, let me try. Uh, hold on. There's another a second. Brenna Galvin signed in. Uh, it says she's not connected to audio. I'm gonna make that a presenter. Okay. Yes. Try that now. Okay, I'm good. Okay. I just there you go. Great. Great. Okay. Now that that's solved. <laughs> Chairwoman Constable, thank you so much. I apologize for that delay. Uh, members of the board of selectmen and um all of you for joining us. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present our proposal for 120 Nantasket Avenue. Uh, my name is Dot Joyce, uh, along with my partner Kevin Joyce. We have communications and development consulting for Latitude 42 Therapeutics, and our team very, very much appreciates the time tonight to share with all of you. Uh, we've done a lot of work. Our team has done a lot of work in developing our plans. Um, back in February, we met with town officials and scheduled our original. Our Presentation and formal abutters meeting last spring. But due to COVID, like everything else, we needed to postpone those meetings until we had a better understanding of how to engage in a community discussion like tonight. We tried to use that time wisely, however, uh, meeting informally with 
who we could identify as being interested in hearing our plans and um, and, and sharing coverage in the health times to ensure transparency of our intentions at this site. Next slide. Tonight, we are finally um, here to present you our plans as requested by town manager and town council. Prior to engaging in negotiations to secure mm -hmm. This is not working. I lost Dot. I don't know if Dot are you still. He's toggling. And they couldn't fit a hundred technology's not working that well. How many people did uh, Susan have Zooming that day? Oh, uh, like 700 for one of them. Wow. Oh. People are going to drop off. Am I back? Okay. <laughs> I think we're having some over overload on our go to meeting. <laughs> um, anyway, we, there are several local approvals during our special permit process. Uh, as this slide will show you, it encourages it encourages a, a very much a robust public input on where permits, permission, and votes of approval are needed. Tonight, we hope to provide enough information to prove to the community they should learn more to, um, and be given the opportunity to scrutinize the details of each element of our plan seen tonight through the more rigorous special permit process. The intention of our project is to create year-round jobs, generate new year-round economic impact, and significant, significantly improve a site that is long sat vacant um, while providing the highest quality experience and products for qualifying Massachusetts patients. The principles of Latitude 42, you may know, um, they're no strangers to Hull. You see them around town. Jeff Shaheen is a lifelong resident um, who has more pride for his town than anyone I know. Uh, and, and Sean Power is a native of the South Shore and recent Hull resident, both with us tonight. I know that you heard from Sean just a bit ago, but I'd like to introduce him to say a little bit about his vision. Uh, thank you, Dot. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, first, that I love living in Hull, so I, I moved to Hull, uh, and it's um, it's where I call where I call home. So uh, I've I've enjoyed the the, the process of, of where, where we've gotten to to date. I'm very proud of the, the business that we're proposing to uh, to build here in the in the town I call my home. Uh, very proud of the team that we've compiled. That we have uh, the 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 state and country's top experts in. Um, In, in medical cannabis and what, what we're trying to do here. Uh, as for as for myself, a little bit of background. I am a uh, I've founded and, and operated and, and uh, successfully run three uh, three healthcare uh, companies. The most recent one was a uh, technology company in the pharmacy space where uh, I built uh, helped build a business, found and helped build a business where we uh, we serviced twenty thousand pharmacies and over fifty million patients in uh, in the U.S. So I'm familiar with uh, with working in a regulated healthcare environment. The team I have has great experience uh, operating and owning these uh, uh, these medical cannabis businesses. And uh, as I mentioned before, I've, I've enjoyed this process to date as it's given me the opportunity to meet uh, so many uh, of my neighbors and 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 discuss um, discuss what our plans are and hear uh, for the most part overwhelming support. And, uh, and as, as I said, I've enjoyed the process. So as we go forward um, with this presentation today, you're going to hear. From uh, from the team and uh, and uh, as uh, as we've gone through this, our philosophy is and will remain the same, which is to be uh, be open, transparent. Uh, we'll talk to anybody uh, in regards to what our plans are. Um, we're happy to share uh, not only the what we plan on doing, but how we plan on doing it with the um, with the town and the community. And so uh, we look forward to uh, to the rest of the presentation here. Uh, to continue to engage uh, uh, anybody and everybody that wants to uh, wants to be heard, and uh, and I hope everybody enjoys uh, enjoys the rest of the uh, presentation. So, uh, Don, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and uh, look forward to the rest of it. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Sean. As you can see, we're very fortunate to have two individuals that have a passion for the industry as well as um, a, a large and very significant commitment to their own community. Um, the mission for, for Latitude 42 is twofold. Set a new standard in cannabis uh, research, development, and care while also improving our community. We're going to be focusing on serving local patients uh, by developing and offering effective options for alternative treatments of ailments and chronic conditions. Many of you may know people who are actually in this space. Um, active adults who want to remain active, uh, athletes looking to improve um, their performance based on natural plant uh, alternatives, uh, people using this treatment for arthritis and seniors using it to stay active as they age. There's a whole bunch of different ways in which people are using these products, Parkinson's disease, um, among others. We also are interested in creating year-round jobs and opportunities for local residents. It's part of part of the goal of this business development for Hull and the scientific advancement of cannabis for medicinal purposes next slide we know Hull supports medical cannabis only and our intention is to look look and feel more like Longwood or Kendall Square and operate like a Pfizer Sanofi or Beth Israel than a smoke shop or any other type of non-medical retail facility as a medical facility we will only be serving qualified patients of Massachusetts. The state has some of the most strict regulations in the country on how we operate and present ourselves. There will be no advertising on the outside of the building and a sign saying who we are is it. Um, of course, consuming cannabis in public on any premises anywhere is illegal, period. Next slide. 120 Nas Nantasket Avenue, you all know very well. Um, it's a large, very large property in need of some significant investment and could be a of the community at this time. We feel this industry and use is very uniquely positioned to offer the returns necessary to support the kind of renovations and restoration this property needs and your community really deserves. We'll repurpose and reuse the building in its current footprint and scale, enabling us to house all aspects of the business. The smallest level of cultivation under state regulations on one part, product development and medical cannabis sales on the other part allowing us to keep all of the revenues of this business in Hull. Next slide. The dollars generated here will stay here. What does that mean? There will be increased revenue from property taxes from the improvement of the building. There will be a host community agreement where Hull would receive 3% or more of all sales, of a prox um, which equals approximately one and a half million over five years, and nearly 100 jobs, including 30 permanent year-round positions, which can provide a second chapter for some in our community or a new career pathway uh, in this emerging industry for others. Sean and Jeff's $4.4 to $6 million investment in this project will bring patients, patients throughout the year who could also support other businesses in the community year round. Beyond the site needing significant improvement, it is also zoned for this use. Locating in, located in the area of town designated as the designated marijuana overlay district, it's many schools include on customers a level of patient safety and convenience will also site delivery entrance uh, for any materials or goods on another part of the building. We small as we're not, we're not having to bring it product in. Everything is going to be grown house. We won't be seeing deliveries like some of the facilities like ours. As an essential business uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the medical marijuana program in Massachusetts saw 245 percent increase. And, and new patients over the two months prior to COVID. There are now 69,087 qualified Massachusetts service through 57 dispensaries. I don't know if someone, but I can hear a little bit of background noise. Yeah. That can, I, can I just take a quick suggestion? Maybe we can try the uh, and turn it back on again manually, if that's possible. That might be a worthwhile effort to try that, um, uh, if that's a possibility. I'm sorry, Sean, what was that? I was suggesting that they, they attempt to mute all and then unmute you. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the organizers could do that. That might help. Uh, and we're going to be unmuting who particularly? Just me. Uh, dot choice. Dot choice. Okay. Let me just see if I've got dot as a caller in. It's already substantially better. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, sir. Whoever muted themselves, that's great. That's great. So go ahead, Dot. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So we were talking about the 245% increase in the number of patients being serviced by 57 dispensaries. And we we're talking about um, a little bit of the demographics of who we'll see coming into the shop. A medical marijuana patient is over the age of 40 years old with disposable income. And we say that, and we know that, because medical cannabis is not covered through insurance yet, uh, but the treatment is becoming more mainstream as more professional sports leagues like the NFL um, are loosening their restrictions on players. We believe that we're going to be very, very well positioned to take advantage of federal funding um, and research as this medical industry continues to emerge, which it seems, seems to be doing every day at the federal level. Um, next slide, good friend. Through a robust set of um, policies and procedures, we are going to focus on protecting our core values, putting people in community first, sustainable practices in our materials and operations, employing the most sophisticated building systems and industry professionals, as you'll meet. We expect to see um, approximately 10 patients per hour during our proposed hours of operation of 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily. And while the patient ex experience is utmost important to us and, and Sean and Jeff, we don't expect there to be um, a long uh, patient time. We are expecting 10 minutes or less, and even significantly less if they boarded ahead of time. Our project proposal includes a, a very significant investment of all, in the, of all the latest technologies uh, to protect our people, community, and property, uh, including a seed to sale tracking software that is connected to the state patient database. We've enlisted the expertise of internationally renowned Kroll Security which is led locally by former Boston Police Chief Dan Linsky. Um, I can put a plug in for Danny. No one knows community policing and um, how to work with, with neighbors better than he does. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dan to go over um, our security protocols. Danny? As Don said, I'm a uh, recovering police officer. I spent 28 years in law enforcement uh, working with communities to make sure that anything that was going on improved the quality of life in the neighborhood. Uh, we have, uh, and if we can go to the next slide, we have uh, the best practices in safety, security, access control, cameras, uh, and, and I'm very much confident in our ability to keep our customers and our products safe at the location. <clears throat> More important to the client than that was to make sure that we were doing something outside the four walls of our facility. So we have developed a, a, a good neighbor agreement that anyone who comes to our facility has to sign. Uh, welcome to the facility. It's your first time here. Here's the rules of the road. Here's some education on what you can and cannot do, what you can purchase, uh, how much you can purchase, how you need to transport it uh, in your vehicle, keeping it locked in the, the trunk or the glove box, uh, how to keep it safe from children at home, that you're not able to divert the product to anyone, uh, you're not able to use a vehicle, and there is absolutely zero public consumption of that. So everyone will know what our expectations are, and if we determine through any way, shape, or form that someone has violated the neighborhood agreement and goes out and uses the product in public or diverts the product to someone that shouldn't have it, they will deal with the law enforcement officials for whatever uh, process they need to, to be dealt with. But in addition, they will be uh, put on a list and they will not be allowed in our facility. It will be trespassed from our property. That information can come to us from uh, an, you know, a formal method, like a police officer who writes a report and says that one of our customers did something to violate the community standards. It could be a uh, newspaper article that reports something that somebody did. It can be a neighbor who takes a, a, a cell phone picture and sends it to our uh, hotline uh, and says, hey, after this person left your facility, they went down the beach and they used your product. Um, we will then look, identify who that person is, put them in our system and notify them that they're no longer eligible to come in. <clears throat> this is medical cannabis. It's not recreational. It's my understanding that uh, the town does not allow recreational cannabis. So these are patients coming in. It's, it's more like a, a doctor or a dentist office uh, type of visit uh, where people come in and around. There's no loitering on property. And we're very much concerned that, uh, you know, we work with the police to ensure that safety and security around the surrounding area of the facility is not impacted in a negative way. We'll take a direction as to whether that's details, whether that's uh, patrols uh, in the area. Uh, but we want to make sure the police have the, the say in that and we will support them going forward. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> As I said, we've got state-of-the-art security and alarm systems, intrusion control, vibration, uh, access control programs, uh, and we're able to track from the very seed that goes into the pot to the to the product sold on the sales floor, who purchased what, yeah. what they purchased, and when they purchased it. Yeah. And all, all of that is on uh, photograph and videotape and are. available to the police. 
So um, only the people who chose to be seen. Seen. Is somebody, can you put your your place on mic? Whoever just came on. Um, thank you. Um, so my job is to work with the community and, and make sure that there's groups that are, uh, if there's intel that we need to be concerned about, things we need to change in how we do business. We have our, our idea on what we should do and how we should do it, but we're also looking for feedback on how the neighbors think things work best and how we can improve operations to make sure we're dealing with the quality of life issues in and around the facility. I, I can talk no. for, for, for hours, so I'm, I'm going to uh, stop there and give it back to, to Dot and uh, leave uh, my responses to questions you may have that, that may answer questions that have come to mind. I'm going to buy again. Thank you, Chief. Uh, while Chief Linsky and Kroll will oversee the ongoing operations and policies, um, he will also be looking to hire, I want to make sure I said this, looking to hire uh, local security personnel to be the daily presence on site. So there's more opportunities for jobs in that space as well uh, with this facility. As we all know, this is an emerging re industry. Um, we're all learning and adapting to best practices as we see it unfold. We're um, fortunate that there are several uh, states that have gone before us in the medical space. Um, and the medical space has actually been in Massachusetts for quite some time now. So we're starting to see some research yeah. here. Um, but feel free, I know you all are doing your own research. And so Just read the back. Examples of um, back. studies that have happened. Second to safety and security, we know traffic and parking is always a key. I microwave them. I'm sorry, could you just put your um, phone on mute or your computer you on mute? You can make those. It's, uh, it's Rebecca Sachs. Rebecca. I don't know if that's possible if one of the organizers can, can mute Rebecca. Hey, Thank Rebecca. you. Hunting for her now. I was going to say, if you're making sorry, something sorry. for dinner, Thank though, I'll down. <laughs> um, we know that traffic and, and, and transportation are always real uh, huge concerns for any community. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Ian McKinnon. He's with our traffic and um, transportation consulting firm, Howard Stein Hudson, who does many projects uh, in this area. Ian, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Thanks again, Dot. As the project's transportation consultant, we understand that your concerns around traffic and parking are always at the forefront. This project will be supplying a full traffic study to evaluate impacts, if any exist, and possible recommendations and solutions. The team also understands that the openings surrounding these sort of facilities also need extra attention, and the project is committed to working with the town, the community, and stakeholders on a very robust operations plan. Next slide. What you see in front of you here is a, a study area map. The site here is centered here in the yellow circle, and the project is situated in such that it is, falls on both Hull and DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation jurisdiction adjacent to the site. And both parties will be coordinated with for safe and efficient access to the site. The dark blue lines here represent roadways that are under the care and ownership of the Department of Conservation and Recreation, and the lighter blue are ones that are under control of the town of Hull. The team will coordinate with both of these for efficient, safe, and, and uh, vehicular and bicycle circulation. The site is very proximate to the Nantasca Beat Reservation and is also served by the MBTA bus route uh, 714, which connects from Hull Ferry to Quincy. Next slide. On this sheet, um, what you're looking at here is a site overview. Um, as a reference, the north to the top of your screen and the beach is to the top left of your screen. Um, the site diagram here shows how site access might work from a, a vehicle and a pedestrian. The green arrows here on this, on this figure show how one might access uh, using the existing curb cut off the corner of Nantasket Avenue and the DCR road for loading operations in the back. Uh, visitor operations and parking will be from the front, and both vehicles and bikes will be able to be stored on site. And the team will be going into a little bit more information on uh, building access here in a moment. Next slide. As a way to demonstrate the total impact of traffic, we prepare, prepared this chart to compare against possible other uses of the site. Along the left axis, um, there's a list of other uses, such as pharmacies, uh, supermarkets, fast food, um, and then on the bottom scale is the total number of daily vehicle trips. The blue represents vehicles coming in, the red out. 
Um, what's important to notice here is at the very top bar is this project, and it is a fraction of the cars that are forecasted to be um, coming to this site with a, either a pharmacy, supermarket, or say a, a fast food restaurant that, that might draw significantly more traffic. And then at the bottom, just for um, a, another comparison, are uh, the average beach days in the Nantasket Beach area, um, one being the average summer day and the bottom bar being the, the most busiest summer day. Next slide. As we get into this process, I mentioned the project will have a very thorough evaluation of, of traffic and parking. And just to give you an overview of what that traffic impact study process might look like in advance of the special permit, I'm just going to roll down through here um, through how we typically do a, a study. We typically start by looking at existing conditions and what typical traffic conditions may be. Obviously, that's a little different in this, in this current um, pandemic world. Um, we look to, to identify what other changes to the environment. There are new traffic from other nearby projects, what the regional growth looks like, and other studies. We're very cognizant of the fact that many studies have been done over the years here in the Nantasket Beach area, and we'll look to those for recommendations. We estimate future trips based on local and industry best practices. Uh, finally, we look at mitigation and how a project might improve access in the area, and oftentimes we do improve traffic beyond um, what exists today. And since this is a planned boutique medical only facility, we anticipate the daily traffic impact to be much lower than any typical recreational facility you might be hearing of. And with that, I'll hand it back to Dot. Yeah. Um, and with, with that, we're gonna get into a little bit now about what this is gonna look like. Is as important as our operations and our policies around safety and security, it's how we build and construct a state-of-the-art facility that's responsible, functional, and beautiful uh, for your community. Um, with aesthetics and operation systems in mind, Ryan Connor, our architect, will walk us through how this building will come to life um, in your community. So, Ryan? Good morning. Thanks, Scott. Uh, All right. Need to make sure you can okay. hear. Yes, please. Great. Um, so, I, I will do a brief overview of both the site design and the building exterior and interior. And here we're starting with the exterior site plan. Um, as Ian had just indicated before, um, we've got Nantasket uh, Ave as our access point. We have an existing curb cut into the customer and patient parking there on the left, that gray area that exists today. Uh, we have some parking at the back of the building. That would be the back, the back right of this uh, image. And then we have loading where that loading truck is in the, in the top right. Those are all of our vehicular access points. In terms of customers, um, and patients, if you will, their access is only at that red arrow on the left. Um, and, and our building really is divided into two kinds of spaces. The purple space is the patient space where you would enter and be secured uh, and collect your product and leave. And then the green spaces to the right of that is really all the both the production office and ops operations of the facility itself. One thing of note in this diagram is on our loading dock on the right, uh, we have an interior 500 square foot room that is for both our loading and our trash. That way we don't have product on the loading dock either going out or going in. It's all contained within the building itself. Slide, please. Um, this drawing is called a section. So effectively, we've peeled off the front of the building. As I'm sure all of you know, this building, it's, it's large on one side and small on the other. And so we've got an existing two-story building and we're maintaining that on the lower side. That is where the parking is on the right-hand edge. That is the entry point for the patients. And that is the, the, the smaller two-story section. Uh, on the left-hand portion of the building, the high base space, we're dividing that up into three levels. And that's really where the grow facility is. That's where, um, uh, that's where we're adding those floors and we'll have three levels of grow in that space. In addition to that, you can see some mechanical equipment on the roof, which we've screened, uh, both of the physical screen and green screen. And then the far left-hand edge, you can see the hint of a truck there. That's the loading at that edge of the property. Slide, please. Um, so uh, here, here's a, a diagram where we peeled off the roof of the building. And, and just like in the drawing before, the right-hand side is the patient area. 
all the way up to that Kirby S counter. And then everything else is either operations or production. Um, really part of this part of this install is, is being a good neighbor and, and being a good neighbor uh, includes controlling the odor. And so this slide, I'll give a, a brief description of all the different odor controlling equipment we've got in the facility. Starting with, and most importantly, our, our DPS sealed wall system. So those light brown walls where the mouse is, those are walls that are a building within a building. Those are walls, those DPS panels are what you use to make commercial freezers, the kind of walk-in freezer you see at the back of a restaurant. They're vapor locked and sealed uh, and come pre-manufactured and snapped together and create these environments that are effectively buildings within buildings. Within each one of those pods, with each, each one of those DPS sealed unit wall systems, we have a closed HVAC system that treats the air within the grow room itself. That is, the air never leaves that room. The air is recirculated and manipulated by that mechanical equipment, but is not either shared with the rest of the facility or the outside air. In addition to that, we've got molecular filtration within the grow room itself to filter the air. Um, obviously, both people need to get into the room and product needs to get both in and out of the room. Um, and so at each location of every door to each of the grow rooms, we have an air curtain. That way we have a physical air barrier to prevent air leaking in either direction. So that's sort of the belt approach, but our belt and suspenders approach is one that we've, we've added that, that green duct, that green line you see running around the property. That is an integrated molecular filtration system that's filtering the air within the facility. So every cubic foot of air is getting filtered, even if it's not part of the growing operation itself. Um, and in addition to that, you can see those little brown boxes on the low story portion. We've, we've added uh, molecular filtration, again, within areas that don't have a grow facility, just as a belt and suspenders or seat belt and airbag approach to make sure we've got the most robust odor control possible. Slide, please. Uh, here's just an exploded view of the grow itself. You can see obviously the plants floating around the middle. The brown boxes are those HVAC units that just control the air within the room. Uh, the, the, the light tan boxes are the odor control. And then again, you see a, a, at the bottom a, a door with an air curtain. And then that green line is the same green line from the previous slide. That is any cubic foot of air that's outside of the grow room is also filtered in the same way. Don't commute their lot. Thank you. Um, so here is the exterior of the building. As you can see, we've got the parking on the right with an entrance for customers, handicap accessible. Behind the stair, you'd see the, the handicap access. Um, and, and back, thank you. And that, as, as all of you know, this building really acts like a backstop or a bookend um, to the end of the beach on that end. And, and, and we think we've got a real opportunity here to do something wonderful with the facade of the building. And we'd like, we'd like to work both with the town and the arts community to make sure this sort of billboard of a facade is, is part of the town fabric and part of, you know, is everything that, that, it, that it can be. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's such a large facade. Um, so we propose to really work with your, with your arts people and with your, your local town people to make sure we we develop that facade in a way that serves all those purposes. And, and lastly, you can see we have the mechanical equipment on top, and then again, the, on the far side, the, the loading of the building. That is, and that is the walkthrough, the short version walkthrough of the project, of the building. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, as you can see, great care and, uh, and research has been considered um, to find the best systems and approach uh, to provide a sterile, very clinical, zero emissions pharmaceutical grade facility at this site. Um, as we know, our owners live here, uh, they're, and, and they really want something to be, everybody to be proud of and contribute to their, their community's economic development. They're prepared to guarantee our performance on odor control through a bond attached to our project through the special permit process. We're, we're, we're certainly very, very committed to it and confident in our approach. 
They're also committed to establishing a lo local advisory committee, regular meetings with the butters and stakeholders, and a commitment to a collaborative approach on security and funding annual community investments as everybody um, should be as, as a member of the community. Um, we are just really thankful um, that uh, Councillor Lemke and Manager Lemnios requested we join you tonight prior to negotiating with our for our host community agreement. We um, we welcome the opportunity to hear from you, and uh, we look forward to continuing to go down this path and, and really dive into all the details of this plan through the special permit process. Um, I guess that's our presentation for now, and I'll turn it back over uh, so that someone can facilitate the question answer period. Is that is that appropriate? Yes, that would be great. Thank Please. you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to turn the floor over to Town Council Jim Lamke to provide a little bit of um, background information. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for your uh, interesting presentation. Uh, what, what I'm going to do for a few minutes is just explain the overall licensing uh, process, uh, which has changed since the last time we did a uh, medical marijuana facility uh, on the state level. Uh, basically, in leaving aside any local uh, permits that are necessary, uh, such as the special permit and site plan review by the planning board and any other local applications, the um, medical treatment center uh, is based on an application form that's submitted to the Cannabis Control Commission. That form has three sections and the uh, three three parts of that form are normally submitted at the same time. The first part uh, is a uh, called application uh, of intent or AOI. Now that includes the form representing that the applicant uh, and the host community have entered into a uh, HCA uh, host community agreement and also proof that the applicant held the community outreach meeting with the public, uh, which has to be held within six months prior to when uh, the application of intent is submitted. Uh, the, uh, at some point, the board will be deciding whether to proceed to uh, negotiate a, uh, a HCA uh, or not, or we'll be requesting more information. But the HCA, uh, the host community agreement, is by state law a necessary document that has to accompany the uh, the application. Uh, but it is a, a document that, in my opinion, the, the town has the, the right to decide uh, at which point they want to proceed to do it or if they want to uh, not proceed uh, to do it. Another part of the application process, along with the application of intent, is a background and check uh, set of documents which is information on all the principles in the business and other background uh, information. The third component of the basic uh, application is what's called the Management and Operations Profile, the M&O. And that contains information as to the business plan, the plan of operation. Uh, it is also supposed to contain uh, a diversity plan, which is designed to promote equity among minorities, women, veterans, people with disabilities, and LGBTQ plus uh, individuals in the operation of the establishment. And there are a whole host of other components to those uh, three parts of the application process. Uh, I just wanted to lay out what those three basic parts are. As in any application uh, process, the uh, Cannabis Control Commission can seek uh, uh, additional information at some point, the uh, Cannabis Control Commission um, would determine that the application packet uh, is complete or incomplete, but if it uh, determines that it's complete, it sends a copy to the town and requests the town to respond within 60 days uh, as to whether or not the proposed marijuana treatment center, the MTC, is in compliance with local laws. Uh, following uh, like that, uh, within 90 days of the Cannabis Control Commission determining that the applications are complete, 
uh, the Cannabis Control Commission normally notifies the applicant that it is either uh, granted a provisional license or it is being denied uh, a license at that point. Assuming that they get a provisional license and they're moving forward, following the completion of the build out of the facility and any final inspections by the Cannabis Control Commission, the facility is eligible to be awarded a final license. And uh, once uh, they're at that stage, there is a post final license inspection uh, which is held. And if the licensee passes that inspection, it receives a notice that it may commence operations. And it must give the Cannabis Control Commission three days advance notice of when it intends to start uh, operating. Um, so that is the, the basic framework of the licensing uh, process on the state level. Uh, right now we're dealing with what's involved on the, uh, the local level at this point, but it's important to understand where it goes from how uh, if it does go forward. So that basically is, is my summary uh, that I have this time. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm now going to turn to the board uh, for any questions or comments. I'm going to begin with uh, Selectman Gray. For people that are checking into it, my guess is the majority of them are probably more negative about it. It's the calling in to find out Correct. rather than those that are positive. Jan, can you hear me now? You know. All right. I keep hearing other voices as well. Well, my yeah. first question is, do you feel there is demand for the product in a small market that already has a company going up in George Washington Boulevard? Is, are we in too small of a community to handle potential more business? You know, so anybody could chime in with an answer on that. I. It's Dot. I'm the Brenna's computer. I think. I think. I think you might need to lower the volume a little bit. Let me try mine again. Uh, is that better? That's better. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, I, I think there, there's significant interest from patients. Um, we talked to the Mass Patient Advocacy Council. Uh, as well as others, and as you saw from our presentation, there's been a significant increase in the number of qualified patients in Massachusetts since COVID-19. Um, we feel strongly that there is demand, yes. Okay, thank you. I have a follow-up question. How many other communities of our size have more than one in their town? I'll have to do that research for you. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I can tell you a, a lot of it is based off the number of liquor stores that are in the, the town. The, the cannabis control audience calls for 20% of uh, the licenses for liquor uh, bar, um, package stores to have at least 20% of those licenses available for cannabis in the cities and towns that allow it. Okay. If I could jump in for a moment, Greg. I'm sorry, I just to remind everybody, if you could please state your name and either affiliation, if you were the proponent, and or address, um, that would be helpful. Sorry, that was Dean Linsky, the security uh, consultant from Kroll. I apologize. Okay. I, Nantucket, I guess. Nantucket um, just so you know, Nantucket has two, um, but some of this is based on whether or not you're referring to medical facilities or um, recreational facilities. As you know, some of them have medical and recreational actually co-located, um, and whether or not you're considering that as two or one or Again, we'd, I, I think to answer your question fully and appropriately, I would do a little research for you. Okay, thank you. And I'm just the sidebar to that one. I, I, I believe it's Rockland. I, I believe they're trying to put in four. I mean, would that be something that could potentially affect future business for what you're trying to do? Again, um, I don't think Sean would be investing in this business if he thought it was going to be short lived. I think, as you see, um, the federal government continue to make changes. And this will become something that most likely will be covered by insurance at some point in the future. I think this is only going to be uh, an emerging 
fully funded and expanding business. I'll just say on that really quick. So uh, I didn't discuss this at the uh, the preamble or the introduction, but I was I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease uh, five years ago. So I was diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's disease. And as I talk to people in the community here in Hall, there's a significant number of people who uh, use medical cannabis that live in the community that go uh, elsewhere in order to procure the product that would love uh, the opportunity to, to uh, stay here. And um, and that's just, um, you know, some anecdotal evidence, but I would not be investing uh, the amount of money or time or effort that I'm doing here now if I uh, if I didn't think that the medical cannabis community uh, in and around the surrounding area could support it. Uh, it just wouldn't make any sense. Thank you. Um, have you done any market studies that would support what you're trying to do. John, do you want to take that as the business uh, side of the house? Uh, we, I don't know what you mean by market studies, but we look at things like population, income, uh, the number of uh, medical cannabis patients in and around the surrounding area on the South Shore, um, the trends in the marketplace. Uh, so these are things that we look at when, we, um, when we're putting together the business plan. Uh, additionally, uh, given that we are a, a, a medical a grow facility in addition to um, a uh, medical cannabis treatment center. A uh, significant number of revenues will be uh, will be sourced from uh, the wholesale out of our product to other medical cannabis facilities across the state. So the town of Hall will benefit from not only the um, the uh, the revenues and the patients that will be visiting the clinic. They will also benefit uh, from the substantial revenues that will be generated from the the wholesale activity out. Uh, into other um, other medical treatment centers, so uh, that's an additional benefit of the of the plan that we have for the facility. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question, Jen. Um, sure. Have you guys been attending, whether it was through Zoom meeting or in person CCC meetings? Yes, um, actually, I I was a consultant to the CCC when they got up and running. I helped them develop their communications plans and their websites and all of that. So I've been in constant communication with them. Okay. Well, thank you, Jen. I'm good for now. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Donna? Hi, uh, Donna Purcell, Select Board. Um, thank you for your presentation and your interest in Hull first. Um, my first question would be, what does latitude for you to perceive the impact to be on the town? From our presentation, we are exploring all potential impacts, in, including um, some significant concerns raised from our neighbors earlier about any type of um, odor emissions, any type of traffic concerns. Um, all of those things we'll be, we'll be researching, even discussing even further through the special permit process. As you saw, Howard Stein Hudson has a significant um, traffic analysis study that they will employ. Uh, it's just too early in the process to do that at this point without having a real project um, ready to go, you know, for a project process in the works. But uh, we do have the obviously projected numbers and, and those are the types of things that we would foresee making sure that we mitigate against. And the other, okay. the other thing I would say is that, you know, from people that I, that I've, that I've talked to again, there's, uh, there's uh, in the local jobs that are here. So, you know, as an example, there are um, there are some some recent grads that I talked to that have engineering degrees that are that are traveling, you know, 50 miles uh, each way to Bill Ricca to get you know an engineering job and uh, and have interest in in, in staying and in, and in working in the town that they um, that they live in. And so, I think from a from an impact uh, on the economy and jobs, I think we uh, we're going to provide sort of a year round, um, you know. Uh, Great place to work, uh, and uh, there's just been interest from the community in regards to in regards to that. Okay, would there be further studies too on parking? Yes, yes. The analysis would be much more detailed on everything in terms of um, trip generation, and if Ian is still on, he can kind of give you a little bit more about the details of what the analysis would look like. But it would be much more robust. Yes, and we also have uh, Sean has been working with some of the local other local neighbors that we have and making sure that we have you know parking options available to us if necessary as we go through the special permit process to expand our ability to park um, more cars in other places but we feel as though the parking we have on site right now is sufficient um, 
but again, we have not engaged in the special permit process with the town to understand fully what their concerns might be around that. Okay, um, another question. Does Latitude 42 see a need to have a plan to positively impact the disproportionately harmed people? And if so, how does Latitude 42 intend to address, to address the requirements to have a plan to positively impact the disproportionately harmed people? Absolutely. And the, the follow up to that would be, how does Latitude 42 define and identify disproportionately harmed people? Yeah, it, it's absolutely something that we will be doing. Not only is it the right thing to do, it's also the requirement by the Cannabis Control Commission. They actually define um, <clears throat> and have criteria about the def what they define as disproportionately harmed communities and people. Um, we will be looking at that criteria as well as people that we feel as though may have been harmed disproportionately by the war on drugs. What they don't know, what they don't notice in the CCC is people who have been targeted by the um, pharmaceutical industry for, and, and have opioid addictions. And so we'll be looking at people who are trying to turn their lives around and also, you know, funding things that might be helpful in helping people turn their lives around in the recovery community. Absolutely part of our plan would not be engaged with this, this organization if it wasn't. Great. Um, I just got two more, three more questions. Okay. Um, what, Come in. We're, well, hopefully we have some good context to provide. <laughs> this is our good. big show. So. <laughs> um, what experience, if any, does the management team have in operating a medical treatment center? I know Sean had mentioned the pharmaceutical and the technology sales, but that's different than a medical treatment center. I'll let um, Sean get a little bit more into detail on his team, but obviously um, I've been involved in the industry since it began. Um, actually, I worked for Mayor Menino for many years, and his friend um, Howard Kessler was beginning one of the first medical treatment centers in the state called NETA, um, and I helped them open from the ground up in Brookline, Franklin, and Northampton um, when they were in Process, kind of stuck in the process during a transition period between the Patrick administration and the um, Baker administration. Uh, so I've seen the, the, the process from the ground up. That's why Sean hired us as consultant team. He's also hired people who have been involved in the, in, um, the actual agriculture of the business and working with um, the medical plants that will be grown. And that's Mike Grasso on our team. And he's hired basically the best in the business across the industry that he can find. Um, Brian Connor, our architect, has developed these, these um, facilities. He really is going to find and um, hire the best he can with the experience and also hoping to find local people. Like this, this is just a regular business like most other things too. We need HR, we need marketing, we need um, all of the back office support systems that any other business would provide. Um, patient advocates, which would be trained by the Cannabis Control Commission, we would actually support that training cost and they would then be on a career pathway to be able to work in any of the industry groups that um, will be opening in this space. So um, again, there's, there's lots of jobs, there's lots of opportunity, and there's lots of experience and professionals that are surrounding Sean and his team and his um, opening of this. I, I don't okay. know if I, I, yeah, I, mean, no, I can cover that a little bit more. I mean, I've, um, you know, the last business that I, that I discussed, it was, it was in the pharmacy space. So it was, it was much like, um, uh, like a local pharmacy and kind of pharmacy. Those were, those were uh, our customers. And, uh, and in regards to, you know, what we're doing here, you know, I'm committed to finding and identifying and recruiting in the, the top talent that's related to only Creating these um, these types of facilities. So you know, I, I was sitting next to is Mike Grasso. Mike has been involved in uh, in several um, of these uh, of these types of operations. And there are some um, you know with any with any business that that I've run, I've, I've, I've started and, and operated you know three successful companies. You uh, you find uh, who you need to operate these things. And so you know um, certainly. Uh, by the time you know this is this is up and off the ground, we'll have um, we'll have the right operators for different parts of the business. Okay, Th thank you. Um, is Latitude 42 willing to share with the town all the submissions to the CCC and any communication from the CCC? Sure. I think most of that is all public record. There may be some um, intellectual property type of stuff that 
perhaps would be. Um, but again, I don't anticipate that. Um, so yes, I think that we would share all of that. Anything that's, any communication with the public entity, as we know, is public records, so, of course. Like when we lived at Have you, anyone, hello? Yeah. yeah. Jerry Manning here. No, I'm with no. Joyce McFadden. Has, has anyone talked with Mike Garancola? Giancola? I think we'll get to the questions after. Um, oh, go ahead. Well, uh, let no, me no, ask no. it again. No, I'm sorry. Are you one of? The, are you with the um, proponents? I'm with the. You're keeping an open mind. I'm keeping an open mind. Okay, no, that's fine. We're just the order is we're going to go turn the turn to the public for questions um, once the board and staff and others have completed questions. So if you could just hold your question, I'd appreciate it. We will get very to good. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have just one final question. Um, does latitude 42 intend to do deliveries to and from the facilities? I know that Tron had alluded to a wholesale portion of this business. Maybe elaborate more on that. If is there going to be more deliveries than that to and from? Now, as I said in the presentation, right now um, in the initial stages, we really are focused on growing the plants for the actual um, patient care facility at 120 Basket Avenue. So the pa the plants would actually be grown on one side of the building and moved to the uh, the dispensary side of the building on the other side of the building. So the deliveries will be minimal. There will be deliveries. There's a lot about that, you know, paper products, things like that, to support our staff and to support um, the actual agricultural portion of the the and, and backroom offices. You know, there's materials and things of that nature that would need to be delivered. But we will not be doing delivery um, of like we're not receiving product delivery to the site on a daily basis or a weekly basis, like. <laughs> But would you be delivering from the site on a weekly basis to a wholesaler? Oh, as a wholesaler, I can let Sean answer a little bit more in detail. I think that's like a phase two or three component of this business. But I I would say that as required, well, let me finish on this point. We are required to deliver um, medical products to people who are um, are not able to travel themselves. So if we had a patient that's not able to get to the dispensary, um, that's a compassionate care part of the, the CCC's regulations, we must deliver to them. So just it, for that, there's not usually a lot of them, but uh, we are required by our regulations under the state law to deliver to patients that have a um, hardship in being able to get to us. Okay. We'll say I'll let Sean get into that. Okay. Sean, did you have anything to add on the wholesale portion? No, that I was just going to just do just what Dodge just said in regards to we are required to deliver to um to the medical patients that can't make it to the facility. Okay, great. Um, th those are the questions I had. Um, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, I'm going. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, did you have a comment? No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> I'm now going to turn to Selectman Sestado, and again, I'm going to re re request that everybody, including the presenters, um, if you could state your name before you speak. We do have guests on the line, um, and, and they're not on video, so they're not sure who's speaking. Thank you. Dom? Thank you. Is muted. I do not see uh, Phil. If you can hear me, I do not see Donald Paul right now. I don't know if he dropped off. It's Greg. He did drop off. He was trying to get in, get on by phone. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I'll jump ahead to to a couple of my questions while we wait for Selectman Sestado. Um, so I just have I have a a couple of questions. Thank you again for the presentation um, and for considering investment 
in Hull. My questions are somewhat specific to outreach to date and the neighborhood in which you're proposing um, project. So I know at the beginning of the presentation, I believe it was mentioned uh, that there was a meeting with town officials and town voters. Uh, I just wanted, I was hoping you could clarify that a little bit. This is the first, because I want the public to know it, it is a comment that we've received uh, frequently of late. And this is the first presentation to the Board of Selectmen um, that Latitude 42 has made. So I just wanted to clarify uh, that piece. And if um, Dot or Sean would like to add anything different to that, feel free. No, that, that's absolutely true, uh, Select Woman. That, that was uh, the process we were required to go through, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. The, okay. In terms of timing, I guess is my, my concern that the town wasn't the first stop. Um, and I'm just going to state that for the record. So I'm just, I, along similar lines, I would ask, you know, how important is it, Latitude 42, that you have community support? Um, both community-wide and from the neighborhood in which you're proposing the project. I'm sorry, I, I may have missed that. How important is it? Oh my gosh, I, I don't think Jeff or Sean would want to um, not have community support. They live there, they go to restaurants there, they're, I mean, we've been working very hard to try and connect with those that would want to be with us and be interested in hearing the proposal because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. We weren't able to obviously meet with the selectmen as early as we would have liked to. We did have a meeting scheduled um, at the beginning of, uh, I'm sorry, it was scheduled at the beginning of April. Our butters meeting was scheduled on uh, March 30th. So we would have been ahead, we would have been uh, much further along in terms of uh, formal outreach if in fact COVID hadn't happened. But while COVID was happening, we were trying to figure out how do we at least make sure people understand what our intentions are at this property. Uh, so we tried to get as many people as we could um, to join a friends and family event, which then led to um, a, a, a meeting with the um, Rotary Club, and then led to a meeting with the Chamber, which then led to um, our neighbors above in Atlantic Hill asking for a meeting. So we were able to generate some um, very informal conversation um, by just trying to get the word out that so people didn't seem as though they were um, blindsided when we did have a, a formal introduction to the town through your your board. The only thing I would say, Dot, this is Sean Power talking. The only thing I would say, uh, Dot, is that I, I think at the beginning you presented a slide with the timeline as far as when uh, when and who we presented to, and uh, I, I believe it was kicked off on February 3rd when we spoke to the town, um, uh, the town manager, and, and council about uh, the process that we need to follow. And were there any about yeah, I just, Sean, is, just so there's no confusion, we did meet with the town manager on February 3rd, and that's when we were given the process to follow. So the steps we took were based on that meeting, and they asked us to arrange the abundance meeting for March 30th that had to be canceled uh, because of the COVID. So it was at their direction that we went forward based on the framework of the path they told us at the time thanks Kevin. if you guys want to if you allow brenna to share her screen again we're we'll, we'll be able to put up slides if there's other questions that might need further clarification we've got some backup slides on some things that might come up if, if that's helpful or useful so my point is just to clarify this is not the first meeting we've had with the town the first meeting was on february 3rd Sure, and to further clarify, I, I had stated to the participants in the community that this is the first meeting Latitude 42 has had with the Board of Selectmen. Um, were there any presentations or meet, uh, butter meetings prior to March 30th? And if so, um, what was the feedback you received at that time? And then also, what feedback did you receive from those groups um, after having those informal conversations? We had informal conversations with community members, uh, friends and family of uh, Jeff and Sean that they identified as want, interested in learning more, but we did not have any formal meetings before the scheduled abutters meeting or the scheduled, um, we, we had the friends and family uh, 
we were trying to do like a friends and family event before the abutters meeting. Um, as you can see on the chart here, this was the timeline we went by. We met with the town on 2-3. We scheduled our abutters meeting and our board of selectmen meeting and tried to generate, um, tried to talk to as many people as possible before that date. But again, um, the state shut down on March 14th. So we were kind of caught in that. Right. I, I'm sorry, there were no other presentations to about it. I believe there was a presentation to the anchor in Hull. Um, I know that I had heard and actually was forwarded a presentation um, that was given prior. So I'm just a little bit confused. No, our first um, our first presentation that we did was a friends and virtual friends and family event on 520. Okay. Um, and again, what was that? What was the feedback that you received? I believe you also mentioned Atlantic Hill, a group in Atlantic Hill. Yep, uh, we did that on um, let's see, on the twelfth of June, correct? Um, we we were. It's it's been um, consistent. We have a lot of support from from people, but obviously there are are concerns anytime there's change, right? So uh, we took those concerns and we put them into our presentation as best we could in terms of responses. Every time we sorry, Don, I don't know if we lost you. I think we lost Don. I'll um I'll continue. I'll just say that yeah, we've met um you know we had we've had these meetings and we've uh you know to the best of our ability we've tried to address all the concerns within the presentation and uh and hopefully we've uh, we've we've done that uh, we've done that well. Okay, thank you. And I know you mentioned, I believe, in the presentation, um, looking at planning documents in town. Are you familiar, or before um, choosing to acquire this location and this project in that specific location, did you did you look into any planning efforts or documents or master plans that may have existed for that that area of town? Before Sean acquired the property, I'm, I'm sure he did some diligence as to what um, he was purchasing. But of course, um, our zoning attorney, um, Phil and Kevin Joyce from my team had looked at um, all of the site specific information. Um, we found it was in the marijuana overlay district. We looked at the um, town, annual town reports that had confirmed that for us because we weren't quite certain it was confirmed. We did look into and do research around that. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so, and you're correct, that, that is, I'm sorry. I, I was uh, given your unified work plan and we read through that as well. So we've been um, looking at the studies that have been done. Okay, um, and that's what I was gonna say is, yes, that is that is a permissible um, business in that overlay district. Um, but the unified work plan, for example, which was a joint effort by this with the state and the town, you know, calls out urban design and land use implementation strategies um, and singles identifies 120 Nantasket Avenue as a potential redevelopment uh, property. And its recommendations are anything but what's being proposed. Um, in fact, they were upwards of 21 residential units, 15,000 square feet of commercial space. They identify that property um, as a gateway um, to the community, and in fact, this, the recommendation action strategy or action item was Nantasket Beach Gateway Park in that location. And I raise it because um, a lot of the feedback that we've heard to date, and quite honestly, a lot of the concern um, that I share with the residents and businesses in that area is whether or not, um, regardless of how one feels about the industry, is that the appropriate location um, for the proposal? and doesn't fit into the character of the neighborhood um, and is the neighborhood both residentially and commercially supportive of it there because that's that's something that this board is going to take into and should take into um, serious consideration there is substantial real estate development and investment um, and a significant residential population that surrounds 120 Nantasket Avenue um, I'm also curious, have you reached out to the state, specifically DCR, at all relative to the proposal? And if so, what was their response? Our transportation consulting team um, 
has uh, that responsibility and they will be doing that as part of the special permit process, yes. But not, a, not as of yet. Um, how important is DCR's traffic? If I could finish the question, I'm sorry. Uh, traffic aside, obviously the property sits at the foot of a state uh, reservation, a family beach area. I can tell you that I, Dan Linsky from Kroll, uh, I reached out to the major from the state police and as far as safety and security issues, he, he was uh, fine with a, a project, making sure that you know we kept up to the standards and exceeded them with the recommendations from Massachusetts. Didn't get into parking or traffic, but just safety and security and law enforcement issues in the area with the state police. Are there safety plans in place already that were presented to him? Just conversations on what the intents were and, and how we would communicate any issues and concerns and a conversation around the good neighborhood agreement, making sure that anyone who does act inappropriately would be barred from the facility. Okay. And as you, I'm sure, are aware, there is already an approved medical marijuana dispensary in Hull. Um, how would you differentiate yourself from that existing business? Um, well, we would be a little bit different in that we're the full complement of the industry in one small in one space. So we have a very small tier two, um, smallest in the state second smallest in the state um, cultivation, the production side, and then the patient experience. We're all, everything is here in Hull purposefully so that we keep all of the revenues of the business and the business in Hull. Um, you know, I would say the other thing is, is that, you know, the owners of this business are lo locals, right? So we live here. So we, um, you know, we take great pride in the fact that we're, we're, we're creating an, an, an operating business that, uh, that I live in. And so that, um, that to me is a big differentiator from what's what's happening down down the street. And the other thing is, is I feel like you know a lot of the um, there's been some mischaracterization of what it's going to be like. I mean, this, the facility is going to be quiet. It'll be safe. Um, it's going to look great. It's it's much like a um, it's much like a like a clinic or a small pharmacy. You know, it's not there. There's um, there's going to be much more control over this than it would be over like a bar or a liquor store or anything like that. I mean, this is um, this is akin to having like a very small co-op farm. It's agriculture. It's not many. It's not heavy manufacturing. It's not even really manufacturing per se. Um, it's uh, it's very much like very safe, clean um, uh, agriculture with a um, with, with a with a pharmacy that you need like almost an appointment based to get in. You need a special card in order to enter the facility. So. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, from from the perspective of how we're going to differentiate, we're locals. We we live in Hull. We're we're proud of the community we live in. We're going to give back to the community we live in. And um, I think, you know, the, just the pride and the products we develop will will will, will make us different for uh, for the customers that, that come to our facility. Okay, um, sure. And I just wanted to know, yes. Uh, yeah, this is Attorney Nasrallah. I'd just like to make one comment extending on what uh, Sean and, and Dodd have stated. Um, in having been a part of a municipality, I was legal counsel, city solicitor for a city for about 10 years, and prior to that, uh, chairman of a, a zoning board for 10 years. And it, it is commonplace and an expected question, do we have too many of this or that, and how do we differentiate ourselves? And I think most government bodies, or a lot of them that we have dealt with, found that it's very difficult to forecast if we have too many or how it will work out, and it's normally left to the marketplace to, to distinguish itself and to, and to prove its own success. And a, a entity like Latitude 42 has to distinguish itself and be different from that which exists because that's part of the competitive process. They, if they didn't have new and innovative ideas, a cost structure that's attractive, a product that's of high quality, then they would be parallel to what already exists. And as far as what uh, the idea that we, we already have one, I can clearly understand that type of a question, and it's a fair question. But again, when we leave it to the marketplace, I think it best determines if there are too many or not too many. Uh, if, if we don't do it that way, then when we have a McDonald's and a Burger King and uh, Wendy's wants to come in, should we allow that because we have too many? 
or a, uh, a shell in a, a mobile, then Texaco wants to come in and Irving's comes in. How do we ever determine that as government bodies or as, as the public? I, I like to uh, believe that the public's concern is the quality and the safety and the controls that will be maintained around a, uh, a private entity. And I think that's what some of these um, professionals and experts that are on this team are here to uh, put forth. So I think looking at the overall picture, some of those issues, while um, understandable, I think it's almost impossible to forecast what's needed and not needed. But in this instance, we're developing a building that's been vacant for over a dozen years. So it's not as though we're, we're opening up a, a new entity and removing, displacing something else. And if it fails, then we have an empty building. I think we only can be on the upswing and bring in a positive and attractive um, uh, facade and in, in, in make a creative, uh, taxable uh, business that will be hopefully welcomed by those who are in need of it and ho those who are allowed to use it. So that's that's my only comment on that because I I've always I always hear in whatever meetings I participated in those those similar questions and I thought I just wanted to kind of expand the answer on that. Sure, thank you. Um, and your points are well taken. You know, I, I think that questions being asked in part, particularly by the board members, um, because as you. As you are aware, um, the town the town has prohibited recreational marijuana. We cannot do that um, on the uh, medicinal side. Everybody just disappeared. Um, that's not on. That's not in the stars for this particular project. Okay, I'll get so off. I'm trying to identify who is talking. Sorry, for a moment. Um, it's, I'm sorry, I was trying to talk. Yeah, we can't hear you. Uh, the, someone may have to do the mute all, mute all again. We just can't hear you. Let's see. Figure out. I think we got it. Okay. On the medicinal side, um, as a municipality, we cannot prohibit medicinal uh, marijuana facilities. However, we could make a determination if it, if it's in, if another is needed in town. Um, and so that, you know, is in part the, the basis for the question. Um, I also want to clarify, I think it was stated earlier, there was a, a, a similar question and one of the, your consultants had brought up the limiting the number of 20% of the liquor. Well, he said, don't worry, don't worry, it should be okay. Okay, good luck. Mr. Booker, I'm gonna mute you again if you don't mind because <laughs> there we go. Um, that that's for for recreational. It's not a requirement that we allow the maximum of 20% of our liquor licenses. It's it's the ability to permit up to. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that for everyone else online. And then I think I have just one last question. Actually, one more comment. Um, it was also referenced that the site is similar to that in Kendall Square or Boston. And I would argue that Nantasket Beach is very different different than um, a research community or a hospital neighborhood um, where we are not like Kendall Square, for example, or a Longwood. Um, those are two different, very different, very different areas. And then my last question is, again, recreational marijuana is not permitted in Hull. If the if the community were to ever enter into negotiations around a, a host community agreement, would Latitude 42 be willing to state, to agree to never changing to recreational marijuana sales? So just a, just a couple of, of things. So one, just to address the Kendall Square thing. We, we agree it's nothing like Kendall Square. I think the comment was made in regards to on the inside of the facility, the, um, the ways in which we, um, we control things, right? The technology that's used, the odor control system, the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the way that the building is constructed and so forth. There's nothing to do with the community or the environment. So um, uh, I apologize if that was, uh, if that was mis miscommunicated or construed. Uh, in regards to the, the recreational, I mean, our, our, the business plan that we've developed has nothing to do with recreational. It's not, um, it's not approved in the town of Hall. I would say that, you know, it's, it's, it's too early for us to commit to um, things along those lines. And if, um, you know, we can, 
we can certainly work with the discussion on all these things, but uh, but not something that we can commit to just on monitor. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions I have at the moment. Is Selectman Sestido back on the, the conference call? Call the meeting. Dot com. Mm, okay, I do not see him, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to now turn over to Town Manager Phil Lemnios for any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, can folks hear me at this point? We can Jen, hear you, can Phil. you hear me? Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you um, folks for coming in. I just want to kind of clarify a couple of things that was referenced earlier that um, the Latitude folks met with Town Council Lampe and myself in early February, which is true, and it's very common for town staff to meet with potential um, developers of the community and it's and they come in and they ask questions about process and questions regarding um, potential utilizations of sites and so forth and we did in fact meet with uh, latitude 42 and it guided them on the process and as a matter of fact um, at that meeting uh, there was a document signed by by the latitude 42 folks that um, recognizes that nothing that we said at that meeting represented an endorsement of the idea or um, uh, you know, an encouragement to uh, do this kind of a business. Uh, anybody has a right to make an application uh, for a business in Hull, and ultimately um, those applications have to go through um, a public process, which is what we're engaged with right now. Um, so that's the, the first point. Um, the, the second point, I guess, is, is I'm still not clear. Um, I understood what Attorney Nassarella said regarding um, government trying to get involved with um, limiting access to the business marketplace but uh, attorney nasarella would also i think acknowledge that licensing for instance with uh, alcohol establishments would would be a, a good example of where that particular uh, theorem uh, has um, a little different application and, and in particular um, local boards of selectmen when considering a liquor license application can take into consideration whether there is a community need for another uh, liquor establishment or another package store and i think that's really going to be a central question on this particular application is, is whether there is a, a need for a second medical marijuana dispensary when in fact we have one that has been located in town it is not yet operating so we really Everything uh, to date would be speculative as to whether or not there is need for a second because the first hasn't even opened. Um, so I think that that's an important point for the board to consider and the community to consider is whether there's a need for a second uh, dispensary in, in town. Uh, further, I guess, and in, in during the course of the, the last probably week or so, um, I know my office and the Board of Selectmen's office has received um, numerous communications from uh, citizens as well as representatives from the various condos and uh, associations and so forth um, all uh, expressing deep concern with um, the location of this type of business in their neighborhood and the concerns um, do touch upon many of the items that you've talked about in your presentation um, you know traffic control uh, things along the lines of odor and so forth. Um, so those are also obviously um, considerations that the board uh, must take into, um, uh, or items must take into consideration as they kind of evaluate whether or not they will choose to enter into negotiation for a, a host community agreement. And that's really what the focus of the discussion is, is whether or not the Board of Selectmen wants to even enter into negotiations it's not board is not required to enter into negotiations for a host community agreement um, and um, my understanding is if the local community through their board of selectmen does not choose to enter into negotiations for host community agreement they cannot be compelled to enter into negotiations is that your understanding from the latitude 42 folks i'll let um Kevin answer this question for us. He's done a little bit of research, but um, Kevin, are you on? Are you able to, or, or Tanya? 
And just before Kevin goes, which which will be to the question of, of uh, our understanding uh, in regards to the legal question that was just posed, I will say that um, that uh, under no circumstances could it be could it be um, characterized that all of the um, of the, the people that have talked about this issue uh, uh, are, uh, are are concerned about it. The, the preponderance of people that we that we've talked to uh, in the community are absolutely for it, and we've we've seen significant uh, support from the community for uh, for this business to be um, to be um, to be owned and operated and for the development to happen. So um, so I just wanted to clarify. Uh, the record in regards to the use of the term all in regards to um in regards to the feedback from the community and then in regards to um you know the demand i think that our position is um is as stated before which is the market should should determine that um i mean the town could very well uh, be um uh, could be uh, the other business that is opening up uh could be unsuccessful um you know the, the market should uh we should be allowed to uh, to open, operate, and, um, and and let the market decide demand. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kevin to answer the more legal question, but I just want to get that, uh, that that out there. Kevin, are you able to unmute yourself now? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, thank you. But uh, I just wanted to point out, first of all, that when the client was going through all this, one of the things that he considered was the town's own zone, zoning bylaw that directs this sort of use to the very location we're at. The second point is that the bylaw itself directs the applicant, says the applicant shall negotiate HCA, shall negotiate a HCA with the Board of Selectmen before the town even considers a special permit application. And that says to me that it's directing us to negotiate with the town. If the town won't negotiate the HCA, then we're in an impossible position. Nobody can go before the uh, special permit board um, in the town at all. And I don't think that's the intent of the application, uh, the intent of this, the, the bylaw. I think that if the town uh, begins negotiations and they never come to confirmation, that's one thing. We've had our chance to put our case forward, but to preclude us out of the process at this very 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 preliminary stage seems to go against the uh the um, intent and spirit and quite frankly the, the plain words of the statute that's involved here uh, and many of the things that you've talked about tonight they need a full discussion and a full vetting of the issues and there's nothing wrong with that that's what the town should be doing but i think it would be really difficult for the town to say we're not going to even let you into our process. We're going to de die, deny you right ahead, out of here, and right at this preliminary stage. And I think that doesn't do fairness to the town, to the clients, and to the patients um, that depend upon this sort of medication uh, for their health. If I could just add to this, this is Jeffrey Shaheen. Thank you, Select Woman Constable and Town Manager Lemnios. Uh, you had asked um, some questions concerning need. Is this something that the town needs? And being from this town, I, I have some uh, some failings on that. And the, the property sat vacant, as we've said, for a long time. So the need to develop that property is definitely, definitely there. Uh, the need for local jobs for this community, we are committed to hiring local. We are committed to hiring local contractors to build this project out. So the need to hire and to employ people from this town, I think we meet that criteria. I think there's a need to support programs like the anchor that you had referenced, Select Woman Constable. And the anchor is certainly one of those programs that we would be heavily involved with and supporting because we know their mission as well. So I think that we have met most of those questions of need is there a need for this and i think that we deliver on a lot of those questions thank you bill you, there you go yeah i'm i'm all set at this point madam chairwoman okay um we're going to give uh, Selectman Sestado, another try here. He is on the line, but was unable to speak. 
Um, Dom, are you Jen, there? Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Jen? Yep. Oh my God, thank you. Uh, Madam Welcome. Chair, thank you. Um, Latitude 242, thank you for the presentation. I did hear the majority of it. I do apologize for having some audio difficulties. I just want to go back to the odor component of it. And I, I did see the presentation about the technology and the double, the double walls and the HVAC systems. Now, let me ask you this. Hypothetically, if you are able to build and there is a documented odor, would you be willing to cease cultivation at that point? Sean and uh, Jeff have committed to uh, putting up a bond, a performance bond. And uh, whatever the town special permit process would require of us for that per performance. I think those are all things that are very legitimate. Absolutely, uh, Selectman, I think those are things that need to be considered as a, a condition of our special permit, absolutely. Yeah, we, okay. Kevin Joyce again, just on one thing. Uh, we, we would expect zero odor to be a condition of the permit. I, I, I think we've been pretty clear about that. Plus the bond is a guarantee, but if the condition of the permit or the standard in the permit is zero emissions of odor, that that's something that we would agree to. We expect it actually. Okay. Now let, let me ask about the product in, in the cultivation component. Do you expect what is cultivated on site would be adequate to meet your demand and your need? And if not, would you then get product or produce, I guess is the proper term, elsewhere? Uh, and if so, where would you anticipate getting that additional product or produce? The state doesn't allow at this point medical facilities to get um, a percentage over, I think, 25% of their products for medical facilities from anybody else but themselves. It's a seed to sale operation. So, um, a vertically integrated seed to sale operation. We believe that the, the even the small scale of our, our grow facility will be able to support the small um, nature of our uh, boutique. Uh, care center. So yes, we believe we'd, we'd be able to grow enough and no, we don't anticipate having to bring in any other product from another uh, medical facility. Okay. And, and I know you talked about the traffic plan. I know you talked about the odor and the loitering, but let's kind of go back to that. Uh, and the reason why I ask is because I think the, the, the question is around the quality of life. So I guess maybe talk to me a little bit more about how you're going to guarantee uh, that that quality of life specifically to the traffic to loiter and to kind of uh, just that area uh, would continue to be that existing quality that the residents now experience uh, and, and kind of how would you guarantee that it would not diminish this is dot again i'm going to turn it over to dan linsky who can talk a little bit about what this kind of facility requires for security and what we would be doing with on-site um, professional security on site as well dan Thanks, Todd. And that's that's why we want to have these these conversations, these meetings to find out. So there's no cookie cutter solution to a facility, right? Each neighborhood, each community is different. <clears throat> so we need, to, we need to work with the neighbors. We need to work with the police. We need to work with the transportation of the city to determine what the issues are. I would rather have if the if the determination is that, you know, we'd rather deal with people doing things four blocks, five blocks in the community. I would rather have police details hired instead of standing at the facility. And, and helping us check people in and out where I think we've got a very good security profile. I would rather supplement the security force of the of the town and pay for officers to go up and down the beach to make sure quality of life is, is not being diminished. And in fact, going forward, <clears throat> let me just tell you that I, I was a, on the state house steps with the governor and about 100 police chiefs and said, we should not allow medical marijuana because we're gonna see increased crime. We're gonna see kids using this stuff. This is gonna be in our schools. There's gonna be break-ins and burglaries. Um, I retired and, and became a consultant. My neighbor came down with stage four cancer. I saw the, the struggle, I was driving her for treatments daily and saw the struggles where, you know, the opioid uh, solution was not, the, was not the solution we needed. Came around to medical cannabis as, as something that I thought was helpful. And when clients started asking me to get into this space, the first thing I did is reach out to Chiefs of Police in Brookline, uh, Salem, Newton, where the first facilities were licensed. And, and I, I wanted to get, you know, I sensed that I was right. And I started pulling crime stats and asking how bad the problems were. And what I discovered was there were less problems. Uh, the crime has actually gone down around facilities. Facilities have actually helped solve crimes. In Brookline, there was a break and entering that happened a couple blocks away. And the high tech cameras on the facility caught the license plate going by and solved that crime. So we've actually seen a decrease in crime and, and an improvement in quality of life around facilities. And we're committed to that. 
and it, you know, I, I look at it as safety and security and, and using the product illegally. Biggest issue might be traffic. And maybe it's working with the town to say, instead of supplementing us with police officers on detail, it's traffic enforcement officers to make sure the parking is done right. I can tell you, whatever the town decides we should have for parking and traffic regulations, we will, our own staff will work on that and make sure we're outside the facility directing and making sure we don't have a negative impact. And then taking direction from uh, the town and also the neighbors and the abutters. You know, I might have what I think is a great plan. When it's put to the test, we find out it doesn't work and it needs to be adjusted. And that's having open lines of communication to the groups around the facility that can help us change our plan on the fly. And I'll, we're, Kroll, a lot of people do the work I do, can put cameras and access control in. Uh, we're an expensive process for the client and the client has asked us to come in just for quality of life because that's what I, what I spent 28 years of my life doing is working with neighbors to make sure that the neighborhood was better than we when, when we found it when we started working on solutions to problems. And again, Steve, thank select, you. Oh, again Go ahead, myself, I could, Jeffrey Shaheen, Latitude 42. Uh, we, are, we are from this town and we are committed to this town. We can actually, we would suggest that we start a community panel uh, to discuss things going forward that we will continue to have as we open and operate. But we want this to be as much community input and transparency as we possibly can throughout this process. So anything that we can do, and our, our employees are gonna be from this town. They're gonna walk home through the neighborhoods. If they see trash on the ground, they're gonna pick it up. That's what that's what our community does. That's the what we're going to portray in our in our industry there thank you okay you have a follow -up uh, matt, oh, i just ask one more question madam chair oh, oh i'm sorry dom yes go ahead that's quite all right thank you i uh, appreciate it just let's go back to the facility itself and maybe you can just talk to me about how it's going to be energy efficient yep uh tanya are you on are you prepared to chat a little bit about our um, energy plans and our... Yep, I'd be happy to. Um, this is Tanya Trevison. I'm with the law offices of Jara Darty and um, counsel for Latitude 42. Um, if Brenna can put up uh, the slides, the supplemental slides, that would be helpful. She just needs, um, I think, permission and access. Uh, Manager Lemnios, is it possible to give her permission to share her screen again? Yes, I'm going to give it a shot. So I'm looking for Tanya, right? Uh, no, yeah. uh, Brenna. Brenna for this. Oh, Brenna. Go get to Brenna. Okay. We try and keep it simple. Oh. So one through up. Oh, that makes it easier. <laughs> All right. Let me just get to Brenna. Hold on. Okay, Brenna should be able to pull up the PowerPoint. Great, thank you. So, oops. Um, there you go, okay, thank you. Uh, yep, so at this point, um, we're looking at exploring different uh, potentials for um, a green roof uh, if the community is interested in such um, green roofs have been shown to um, conserve energy um, as well as uh, water usage um, we're also looking at exploring the potential for solar panels uh, if the community is interested in that um, that would affect uh, you know the the uh, top of the building of course and we are definitely going to be using LED lighting um, as a means to conserve energy. Okay. Also, the, the Cannabis Control Commission requires us to have a fairly robust plan as it relates to our energy consumption and our um, energy efficiencies that we'll be working on as part of our application process to the state. So thank you very much for that question. It's certainly something everybody uh, in the industry is looking at. Great, I appreciate it. Madam Chair, I yield it back to you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, I just had a follow-up question. I believe uh, Town Manager Lemnios has an additional question as well. So just a 
I think a clarification, I believe it was referenced earlier that there would be a performance bond um, relative to odor control issues. Can you just clarify, is what would that bond cover? Would that co cover adjustments to the system or are you saying that would cover potentially uh, revenue loss because the operation, you'd be amenable to ceasing operations if order were a demonstrated if issue in the community? Yeah, as, as Kevin, I, I think Kevin might be on still. As Kevin mentioned, we would expect the condition of our special permit to be a zero uh, odor emissions facility. So that that's a given. Um, and as for the performance bond, I think that's something that would be worked out with the special permit process as to what that covers. But Kevin, are you on to clarify? That's, that's the gist of it. You just said, said what I would say, that the, the details of the bond we would expect to be worked out uh, with the permitting authority as part of the permit process. We would expect a condition of the permit to be zero auto emissions, and we we put a bond in place to guarantee that. That the exact details of it would be left up to the uh, the process in the town once we get into the process. But that's the promise we're willing, that, that, that we're making. Thank you, um, Phil. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, well, one again, one of the big concerns, obviously, the conversation there is the environmental impact of the facility, odor in particular. So you're proposing, you know, based on your description, you know, very highly technical odor control process. Where else in Massachusetts is this process being employed for a similar facility? All of the elements of this are being used in different facilities. I don't know of any that are layering them on top of each other. Well, we're, if we wanted to call another community that has most of the elements or all of the elements that are split into different components, would you be able to give us, is there anybody local in Massachusetts that's utilizing the technology that you're proposing? Yes, so Campville is one of the um, uh, companies we're using. They're the leading leader in the in the country. I can let Mike Grasso talk a little bit more about. Oh, okay. But yes, in the state of Massachusetts. Hold on, we're gonna. I, I see Gene Penta. I think has arrived. Okay. <laughs> whoever that, whoever that is, we'll we'll see if we can use her. Yep. Sorry for the disruption. That's okay. Campbell Dyer Scientific. Um, they are. Buyers, I don't think, has done anything in Massachusetts yet. They are a California, Colorado-based company, but Camphill certainly has, I believe, and we can get you some of their details on that. They also have a terrific website that walks you through um, some of their product offerings that also gives some background on them. Mike, do you want to talk about a little bit about your your? Well, I, I guess to, to help, I guess, focus the discussion, um, Obviously, somebody designed the system, right? Was it the architect who designed the system? Was there an environmental engineer that was involved in the design of the system? And there are standards that I'm sure the engineer was trying to achieve and beliefs can be achieved with the system they designed. So can you share that with yes. us? All of those folks were involved. C3, um, which are the engineers, our architect, um, industry experts, uh, people who are experts in odor filtration and mitigation from across the country, the product developers themselves, Campville and Bayer Scientific, as well as research that um, our own teams have done on what's happening in other parts of the country and here in Massachusetts. <clears throat> Obviously, several of us on the team have been involved in other organizations. Not um, Mike has the most in most background in the actual per, um, performance of their grow facilities than I do. That's why I was trying to turn it over. Yeah, well, Mike's on, he's here with me. Thanks, Dot. Yeah, my name is Mike Grasso. Again, I design and develop cannabis businesses. I've been doing this for 10 years. Um, I've built businesses for cannabis in Colorado and Oregon and here in Massachusetts in the licensed medical industry. And uh, the businesses that I work with um, to develop odor control plans are the top odor control companies in the world, actually. So Bayer Scientific, who Dot mentioned earlier, they're the industry leader in odor control and management, not just for cannabis, but also for waste management. They've been doing this for dozens of years, and they used to primarily work with um, waste management companies doing landfills and uh, things that are actually a lot more smelly uh, in, a, in a general speaking term than cannabis. Um, and now they actually cover 
the largest licensed producer in Canada, um, which is over, uh, mil it's millions of square foot of production. And they, they have over 8 million square feet of production that they work with um, in cannabis for odor control. Camphill, on the other hand, is another very, very um, well-known company in odor, odor control and management and also air filtration. Um, and we're working with them. They have a Massachusetts office and a Massachusetts rep, and they are in several uh, cannabis cultivation facilities in this state as well. Um, the experts we're working with, again, aren't just experts in the odor control field, but are experts in the cannabis odor control field. And along with their expertise and my experience building facilities like this, Ryan Connor, our architect's experience in building not just medical cannabis facilities, but medical grade labs, um, all kind of work together to make sure that this particular plan is extremely extensive and covers odor control in a way that really hasn't been done to this extent before. I'm, I'm not aware, as Dot said earlier, neither she, of a facility that has gone to these lengths to put, like we said earlier, a belt and suspenders on this. I mean, we're not going to get caught with our hands as far as odor control is concerned. It's our number one priority at this moment. So is there any facility in Massachusetts that is close to this level of control? I mean, because basically what you're telling us is, is this would be a first of its kind system, maybe anywhere, um, but certainly in Massachusetts, right? right. Yeah, so what I can tell you is that uh, molecular filtration and carbon filtration, which is where, uh, that's the technology that Camphill makes, is very common in the cannabis industry and is utilized in almost every licensed cannabis facility that I'm aware of. Um, our environmental design, our, our engineering, uh, the process of actually putting a room within a room, that's another process that's very common within cannabis um, to create a sealed environment. And that's helpful not just for odor control, but also to control um, any sort of pathogens that may be coming in from the outside to keep our plants very clean and to keep our products safe for our consumers. Um, so, and so again, that's, in, those are two layers in, that you often see independently in other facilities that we're gonna be putting on top of each other to guarantee this odor control um, is, is a successful. So product. in Massachusetts, you'll be able to identify some communities or locations uh, where we could, if somebody were interested, they could go visit. And I recognize it would not be exactly the same, but would have some analogy or not? There's only, so there's only five, there's only five tier two facilities in the whole state. Um, most of the cannabis grow facilities are much, much larger. There's only five that are of our size in the whole state out of the 57 um, grow facilities. So first of all, <clears throat> you have to narrow it down to those five. Mm -hmm. And of those five, how many have, had the resources initially to invest in what what we're investing in. I don't know. We'd have to research all five of them. We mm -hmm. can find. But uh, again, we couldn't say that with certainty today. Could we try and find that for you? Sure. I think that um, the bottom line here is that we're willing to make it a condition of our permit, and we're willing to back it up even with a bond beyond that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Hi. Follow-up question, and then we are going on two hours, and I know we have a number of questions um, from the community in the chat section. So ju just dot a quick follow-up. You mentioned that there are five other facilities of similar size. Can you tell me a little bit about where those facilities are located um, within those and which communities? Uh, Barry, um, Lester, Bellingham, and uh, I can't think of the other ones off the top of my head, but I can get them to you it's right on the Cannabis Control Commission website. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, Bill, do you, do you want to have, I'm just gonna turn to you for a moment. Um, sure. Do you want to go through the chat feature? I know I collected a list of, yeah. of things. I, I think, think you can mute yourself, I think. That might be the easiest. Yeah, uh, I'll try to just, I'm gonna, quickly go through, there's uh, quite a few. The first five minutes or so of chat basically was related to uh, the sound quality, so we're gonna get rid of that. So I've got the first one of substance was Cynthia Ryan asked, what kind of recourse do a butters have should there be odor problems despite the use of state-of-the-art charcoal filtration? And I think that's been addressed a number of times during the course of the conversation. Um, you know, the proponents have said that they would put a bond up um, and so forth. Um, so that's the first one. I've got uh, 
Thomas Wynn. Uh, again, this is related to odors. Um, can developers guarantee there'll be no odors outside the building at any time? Two, is it clear they are planning to remodel the inside, but what is being planned for the exterior eyesore that is now? So I think that was covered in the presentation by the architect. Uh, traffic down the access hill will be troubling. Right now, the, uh, the road is often blocked with barricades. It's also a main entrance for the beach. So this is a traffic flow. Can they comment on flow and parking, which I believe they have. Um, and then the fourth point of the individual's question was, why do we need two dispensaries in Hull? Both are at the entrance of Hull. This will now be the face of Hull. Do Hingham and Cohasset have similar facilities? So I think it's more of a rhetorical question than a, a direct question. A um, couple of questions from a Jennifer Ashley. A month ago, her and water company sent a robocall about the water tables in Hull and asked residents to decrease their water use as there was not enough water. We cannot supply the basic needs of current residents. Um, so I guess that goes to the, I guess, a question to um, the proponents um, about water usage. And I know that there was a question asked earlier about energy usage, and I saw that you had some slides on water usage, but didn't get a chance to um, uh, go for that. Correct, we have them. If you give Brenna access, we can share them with Tanya walking you through the water consumption. Um, projection. Okay. Uh, Dan Linsky from Kroll here. Just, just, I have a number of clients in other uh, states that have, are, are farther along in this process, <clears throat> and they're, the clients use a, a water reclamation process with the HVAC and the dehumidification process. In some instances, we're seeing 500 gallons of water coming into a facility and uh, 425 gallons being reclamated back in and reused. So. Um, there is water that's required, but a lot of this is is reused by the systems in place to be environmentally conscious and, and, and the desire to use the water that's generated by the facility itself. Thanks, Chief Litsky. Okay, this is and Tanya Thompson again. Um, just to, Brenna, thank you for pulling up the slide. We did contact Aquarian um, to get uh, information on local uh, water usage, uh, as well as comparing that with what the Cannabis Control Commission uh, guidance is with respect to water usage. So you'll see on this slide, um, based on the architect's presentation, we will have 16 grow rooms um, that will measure a total of 11,989 square feet. Um, which would use 58 gallons per day based on the guidance of best management practices from the Cannabis Control Commission. In addition to the grow rooms, we will have four kitchens um, in the laboratory areas, which will use 225 gallons per day, and four bathrooms that will use 57 gallons per day. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide gives you a comparison of average monthly water usage. Um, this is the data that we acquired from Aquarian Water Company based on July 2019 billing and consumption of neighboring properties, uh, 115 Nantasket Avenue, which is the Nantasket Beach Hotel, has just under uh, 60,000 um, gallons per month. 121 Nantasket Avenue, which is the Ocean Place condominium, utilizes just over 60,000 gallons per month. And uh, the project itself, Latitude 42, is anticipated to only utilize 10,440 gallons per month. Uh, two slides ahead, please. A graphic of the water usage in the cultivation process. So we will have a 3,000 gallon tank, which is basically the reservoir tank. From that, the plants will be watered via an automatic drip irrigation system so that it will be computer monitored. We'll be able to track all of the water used. From the plants, then, there's a process called transpiration, 
where the plants release water into the atmosphere. And as our architect, um, Mr. Ryan, had explained that each of the atmospheres, or I should say each of the growth growing rooms has its own self-contained atmosphere. So the water will be reclaimed and the HVAC system will capture 97% of the reclaimed water that's returning to the reservoir tank and the process will start over again. All right, I'm gonna, um, I hear somebody's phone on, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna leave Brenna as a presenter, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair, and sure. just continue reading some of the notes in case there's a need to get back into the presentation for any uh, clarifications. Yeah, um, and Phil, if, if you could summarize some of the questions, I think that's fine. We'll go back to those okay. individuals who posted in case they felt it was incomplete or have a follow-up. All right, so the there was a qu question from Terry Petrilia that had to do with um, water, power, traffic, and parking, which I think have all been addressed throughout the course of the presentation, at least the, the proponents have addressed uh, it from their perspective. Um, parking for uh, allows 18 parking spots. Um, parking would need to consider employees, customers, so forth. Um, so they're just asking basically if there's enough parking on site or available in the area. And that would typically be addressed through the site plan review of the planning board. Um, and in the overlay district, people may or may not know, but um, you're able to incorporate to some extent the DCR parking lots as part of available parking for your needs in, in developing a business in that area. Um, I'm going to move on to, let's say I've got um, there was a question on electric usage, which I think has been addressed. Um, a, a, a direct abutter from the hotel across the street was asking again about customer parking spots and questioning whether there's adequate parking on the site for both customers as well as employees. And I'm getting to moving it down as quickly as I can. Let's see. I'm going to uh, questions about odor control and traffic again. So the, it seems to be centered. A lot of the questions are centered on many of the topics that have been covered, which are questions about odor control, traffic, and then there is um, there is a fine, there's one last question, which is a new one, which is a financial question, and I'll just it's in depth, so I'll just kind of read it if you could, if I could, Madam Chair. And this is from an Amy Lemkin, uh, Lem Lemkin. Proposal shows an estimate of $1.5 million per year at 3% revenue for Hull, which corresponds to gross revenues of $10 million per year for your company. Um, even working 365 days a year, 10 hours a day, 10 customers per hour, that corresponds to 28,000 per day of revenue for your company or $280 per customer transaction. Um, so I guess it, it Ultimately, it goes on uh, to get to, uh, it's really just a question, I guess, on the financial uh, accuracy of the projections and how Hull gets to its $300,000. So I don't know if uh, Sean Proctor can speak to that as the main proponent. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to it briefly. The, the the math there is accurate in regards to the the um, the, the revenues and the uh, the projected three percent and the uh, um, the number of, of days in a year. So that that math is all accurate. Okay. Um, and I'm just getting to the next bunch. Uh, there was questions about water and water usage, which again have been addressed. Um, Uh, a question as to what's the timeline for the medical facility on George Washington Boulevard to open. Um, and again, this question about whether the community can support too. Uh, George Washington Boulevard facility is in process of 
fitting out their space. And uh, my understanding is, is they are tending to open before the end of uh, this current year. Okay, questioning about some of the finances. Almost done, Madam Chair. That's okay. Uh, Maybe we can piggyback, uh, Phil. I, there's a question sure. from Ben Maitland Lewis. He wanted to know um, if you had other potential sites, if you have, had investigated other potential sites, um, and if the why or why not did you select those? Um, and just making a comment about not having being a resident in that neighborhood, but not having been reached out to um, to date. So, Sean, I, I can't see you because of the um, presentation is up, so I don't know if you want to talk about uh, why you chose this building. Obviously, it's in the marijuana overlay district, and there's um, specific sites within the town of Hull that, that you must site your facility in. I don't know that um, we felt that this building is in need of significant investment and that this particular use would generate the revenues and the, um, the returns necessary to do all the improvements with the least amount of impact for the town. Uh, the second part of the question in terms of the, uh, we apologize if, if we did the best we could to try and get to as many people as possible without having a formal um, meeting. Um, COVID has dampered that for us a little bit in terms of getting out sooner, but we did um, try and get um, local coverage in the, in the local newspaper to try and at least share with people what our intentions were for the project and kind of get people to get in touch with us as, as we could. We also sent out a direct mail to the butters list we had originally um, from the town uh, part of as part of our original process. And we, uh, you know, we um, went ahead and sent a letter to each one of those abutters on the list um, ahead of this meeting just to let them know that it was happening uh, in an effort to get as many of our abutters um, notified of this meeting as possible as well. Okay. All right, a couple other, Madam Chair. Um, sure. One question is, Is um, did the purchase and sale have a contingency, meaning that if you were not to get the ability to operate this facility, um, you know, does the, the PNS uh, revert back to the original owner? No, John, you can, you can clarify, but no. Yeah, no, then, no contingency. All right, and then what is plan B if you were not able to locate a medical marijuana facility in the building? We intend to open them. <laughs> I don't think there is a plan B there's, at this there's, point. There, there's no plan B. We, we intend to open the facility. Um, and let me just, I'm kind of almost down to the kind of the tail end. Um, there are, there is a comment, looks like a well-designed building has been well-planned. Um, there's questions about parking, revolving parking, and whether there's adequate parking when you take into consideration the employees and so forth. Um, one of our, are the patients by appointment or drop in only? We would absolutely entertain um, an <coughs> only uh, system if that was required through the special permit process. We don't think at this point um, medical facilities have the type of uh, volume that a recreational facility does. If you go to Cambridge to um, there's a Fawcett Street or to Somerville on uh, Broadway. Uh, Revolutionary Clinics has two medical only facilities and they really see very few customers um, per hour that they would need to have appointments, but we would certainly entertain that as a, as a condition period of time to see how our operations go. And also it would probably be good practice as we consider an opening strategy to do a, an appointment only opening strategy um, and test the facility as well for our own purposes. There's also a question here how other states limit cultivation to industrial manufacturing zoning due to a risk of fire, explosion, et cetera, um, which is a risk of cultivation. Hull and notes that Hull does not have an industrial or zone manufacturing zoned areas. Um, so the question is, how do you propose to 
the risk in heavy populated travel area? And I guess I'd add on there, are there any other similar facilities in a non-industrial zoned um, area that you're aware of? So Dan Lenski from Crawl, I can just tell you that most of the extraction processes I've seen approved are not with butane, uh, it's with CO2. And when you talk to the fire department, they would prefer that because that's where the true hazard is if you're doing extraction with butane methods. But but other methods are, are not uh, as a, any issue or concern with explosives and hazmat, except for obviously oxygen deprivation if you're in a confined area with a leak. Um, so I'll leave it to Mike to, to talk more about that. But you, I, I assume we're going to work with the fire department to make sure that our process is compliant with the safety and security of the facilities that they have in, in the town. Uh, and explosive capacity is not something that we should be dealing with, like we see in other facilities. Well, thank you, Dan. That was really accurate. I just want to add that we will be utilizing CO2 extraction, which uses the same CO2 canisters that a bar would use. I'm sorry, people can't hear me. So. Trying to identify who's. It's, uh, it's caller 103. And uh, Donald Parker. My turn. <clears throat> Hi, sorry about that. So what I was saying is we are committed to making a CO2 extraction facility. And, and CO2 extraction, there have never been any documented cases of explosion. CO2 is a non-flammable, non-explosive gas. Um, and the canisters of CO2 that are used for this process are the same that you find in bars to carbonate tap lines. Um, there are still measures put in place when you're building a, a CO2 extraction lab to make sure that it's safe. However, unlike butane and propane extraction, CO2 has never been an issue and I don't see it ever being an issue as far as safety is concerned. Hey, Madam Chair, I've got a couple of quick follow-ups. Go ahead, Phil. Um, is this a viable going concern if the grow facility portion of the business isn't pursued? Would you still be profitable with just the medical prescription sales? Uh, do you want to take that or you want me to? I, I can say that the whole well, I mean, idea. First, it, it has to be fully uh, integrated seat to sales. So as, as medical, it, um, you know, that, that's, that's a requirement and uh, uh, and I have no plans uh, as relates to opening just a um, just a, a clinic. Um, so the the uh, the agricultural is uh, is part of the plan. So is that a no? It would not be profitable. Uh, well, first, it's I um, mean, Doc can answer this to a certain degree, but it's not it's not possible. It needs to um, it needs to be fully integrated. It's not allowed. Yeah. It's a vertically integrated business, um, and the whole idea is that. Sean wants to repurpose this building. And so in order to repurpose this building, vertically integrating every aspect of the business in it is the way to do it. Um, I don't I don't think profitability is really the case. It's about using the building to the best um, potential for this business. And so- So can I ask a follow-up question to that? Sure. I don't know who's talking, I'm sorry. I wish- <laughs> Sorry, this is this is Pat Cormier, um, well, I'm gonna, I'm, resident of Hall. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Pat, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, channel you through the chair and let's see if it, if the chair permits you, I'll let her let you go. You know, okay. she'll let you Thank go you, forward. Phil. Uh, Pat, do you mind holding holding? I will give you an opportunity to follow up, but just so that we can get through the questions because we are going on almost two and a half hours. Um, sure, that's fine. It's just a it's a follow up to what she just said in terms of the fact that it's a seed to sale. And my my question is, why is the other medical distribution not growing where they're present so it's it's a related question but i can okay. hold on I, okay i think you just asked it so we'll let it um or sean answer that please yeah they have a grow facility it's just not in hull so their business of growing is in another location which means they're bringing in their product all the time daily or weekly or bi-weekly or however they're doing it so do, i guess i'm going to add for clarification, it does not need to be in the same facility, in the same building. No, but we do have to grow our product, and so this building allows us to do everything in one space. Which again is the least traffic impact that I could 
that there could be for the community. So we're not going to have trucks driving into the neighborhood like the other facility will, um, you know, bring a product in. Uh, can I just ask a question then? How will product leave the building? Patients will buy it. Madam Chair, I don't know if you want to open it up, given that we're uh, breaching two and a half hours. I don't know if you want to let the maybe the representatives from the various uh, condos speak, because I know that's one of the things on the chat. There's folks that are kind of saying, I want to speak, I want to speak. Um, yeah, I, agree. I agree. So I think the first one um, that I came across, I'll start with Polly Rowe. And this will take the heat off 242 for a moment. I believe Polly has a question for the Board of Selectmen. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Polly. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Board, uh, Board of Selectmen, members, town manager, and town council for taking my call. A very quick comment as I'm listening to the presentation. I know myself and the many in hall with whom I've discussed this, the issue is purely a matter of logistics of an indoor commercial based cannabis grow facility. Um, my understanding from talking to several in the industry is that cannabis cultivation grow facilities by design are intentionally supposed to be isolated and distanced away from residential areas. And this is a residential area and it's on the DCR Nantasket Reservation Beach, which has families with children. My question to the board is as follows, notwithstanding a bond offered by Latitude 42, is the town of Hull willing to accept liability for toxic emissions, odors, and illnesses caused by allowing an indoor commercial cannabis manufacturing facility to be in our residential community. I am going to turn to town council, uh, Jim Lampke. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, that, that's not a question that can be answered uh, on the fly here because it requires a, a much greater analysis. The town does not intend nor do I believe that the town would be liable if uh, there were adverse consequences by uh, the, the granting of any authorization to operate. Uh, there, it's not much different than if the town issues a building permit or issues an alcohol license, uh, unless the town was grossly negligent or made certain representations uh, that the town would, would not be uh, liable. So if your question is, uh, what is the liability to the town if things don't work out right here? Uh, while anyone can sue, it would be a, a, a very challenging case to make the town somehow bore some liability. Okay. Thank you. Are you all set, Polly? Yes, I am. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. You're welcome. Uh, Tracy Connors, are you still on the call, Tracy? Okay. Um, uh, Phil, did you identify? Is there anyone else who can identify from any of the condo? Um, yes, uh, Don Brooker from Ocean Place Condominiums. I'm right here. I have my chance to speak, Phil. I, I yes. believe you would. Uh, it's your opportunity through the chair. Uh, yes. Madam, Madam Chairperson, uh, for the record, my name is Donald Brooker. I live at Ocean Place Condominium, lived in Hull for 68 years, lived at Ocean Place for 20, 40 years as a police officer, and 25 as your police chief. That's a little background. I had several questions as a result of my interaction with members of the uh, citizens group in opposition to Latitude 42. Well, and one of them, or the first one I was going to ask, had to do with 
the two medical dispensaries in Hull, both at the entrances to the town of Hull. Uh, fortunately, uh, Mr. Lemios answered that uh, quite well. The other thing that's missing, of course, is the market will determine whether or not they're viable and at what cost to the community. That is yet to be determined. If in fact we continue, we have two separate places. Uh, with respect to that, I, I have a statement I'd like to make and, and a question for the selectmen. Commercial marijuana cultivation is an industry and as such to allow this manufacturing facility to be located at the gateway in the Atasca Beach Reservation, which is highlighted by our majestic beach, which is why we are considered a recreational beach resort tourist community. Little background. My question to you is, and this is to the Board of Selectmen, do you want to do a real disservice to our town by which will most surely alter the quality of life of that which our community presently enjoys? That's a question that you as a board has to answer. And I just want to take a little exception to some of the other comments, if I may. There was a talk of three police chiefs uh, who have no problem with this or whatever the situation was. I'm an elected member of the Board of Directors of the Southeastern Mass Police Chief Association, of which two of these chiefs are, are members of, approximately 120 chiefs. If you listen to what was said earlier by the proponents, there's at least five facilities in the state. I'm sure there's a lot more. None of those police chiefs, other than these three, have commented in a favorable position. There's 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth. And out of the 351 cities and towns, we've come up with Brookline, Salem, and Natick uh, as uh, in favor of uh, not having a problem with this type of facility. As a former police chief, as a resident of Hull for 68 years, I am in opposition to it for those reasons and many of the other reasons that were adhered to earlier in the uh, uh, situation that we've been listening to for the last two and a half hours. I, I thank you for your time and effort on this endeavor and look forward to working with anyone who is in opposition to furthering the proponents uh, Latitude 42 progress. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chief. Oh. Madam Chair, I, I guess. Um, Madam Chair, may I respond? Um, one moment, please. Phil, did you have, want to say um, anything? At, Atlant at, I don't know if there's anybody from Atlantic Hill condominiums um, that, that would like to comment. Um, right here, Phil. Here as well. Hello, um, Madam Chair. This is Joe Small of Atlantic Hill. I'm one of the trustees of Atlantic Hill II. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, listen in. I also want to thank Latitude 42 for one of the informal meetings that they offered some of the trustees dating back to uh, June 12. Um, I'd like to go on record to say that it just absolutely breaks my heart to see this beloved community torn over supporting versus opposing this initiative. Our town needs business, and we need the kind of business that can bring jobs and tax revenues on an annual sustainable basis. That being said, however, our town also relies on a quality of life, particularly in attracting families to our community to sustain our schools. As we know, our student enrollments are declining. I wish we had a magic wand where we could propose to Latitude 42 a land swap, some of the location in town where you can set up this facility and turn that aquarium into a much needed senior center and bulldoze beach fire and turn that into a park. That's what this community deserves. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Small. I'm um, Tricia Scholar. I'm at Atlantic uh, Hill One, and I just would like to mention uh, that there was a lot of talk of um, uh, conversations happening with our community. 
I, I mean, over the last weeks, I was so surprised to hear um, how little the community really knew about what was um, going on. Um, and I can say after talking to many uh, people in, in our community that the majority are, are not uh, in support uh, of this. Um, in addition, we are really concerned about the environmental uh, impacts and would like to see um, studies done and you to disclose uh, those findings. Um, in addition, I'm a uh, cognitive uh, developmental uh, researcher, and you know it, it also shocks me how li little we heard about the impact on children uh, as well. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scholar. Do we have any other um, condo association representatives? Yeah, this like is, this is Connie Hubble from Oceana, right, right behind the aquarium. Um, you have said in yesterday's Patriot Ledger article, you had said that preliminary traffic studies have been done already. And I found that surprising because since you bought the building, State Park Road has been closed, okay? I also think you need to do a traffic study um, both in the summer as well as in the winter when State Park Road is unpassable because of snow and ice. So how could your facility operate if State Park Road is closed? What about the explosion risk, the traffic risk? If skate park closed is impossible, which it always is in the winter, and it's now closed and it's been closed since you start, bought the facility, how could this possibly work? I, I think our traffic consultants are still here. They can tell you about what science they use to do projections. But of course, we would do a a really in-depth traffic analysis study um, as part of the special permit process and it would be as robust as you speak so absolutely right I that, but i don't think that you are aware that state park road is a big cliff and it's impassable with snow and ice in the winter okay now it's been closed since you guys bought the facility so what's your answer now if there was I mean, again, these are all questions that would be delved into in much more detail with, through the special permit process. Um, we have given, you know, what our projections are based on what the other types of uses could be at this facility. Uh, we believe we have the least amount of impact for the for the uh, facility based on that. Um, again, State Park Road being closed, obviously, we would have to consider that at some point in time, especially during the winter months, as does every business. I have another question too, John, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. It's been claimed that the facility would be odorless and free of chemical emissions. This would differ from the experience of other marijuana manufacturing facilities. If this is true, why wouldn't you guys have sold that proprietary manufacturing technology to other facilities? It seems like you could have made millions of dollars by selling this proprietary technology that you're claiming. But that, that's not the case. I'm sorry if that's miscommunicated. Mis um, we don't make the technology. We're utilizing different technologies layered on top of each other. Um, well, why would you have sold the processes to others that are battling this across the country, across the world? Perhaps they will. I mean, again, we we are using what we believe is going to be um, a very good and, and solid plan. Our permit, would we hope, would be contingent upon our, our being odorless. And also, we're, we're prepared to put a bond up to insure it even further. Okay. And I have one question regarding the insuring it. What is the size of the bond, the dollar value that you referenced early, earlier? What is the size of that? That would be determined by this, the town and through the special permit process. Okay. And what about your conversation? No one seemed to answer the question earlier about your conversations with the DCR. Um, I, I didn't hear an answer about what the DCR set, has, has said about this. I mean, it's literally stepped away where people from Boston, Boston, all different communities come to. What has the DCR said about this proposed facility? So, what do, I, 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 can say that. I, I don't know what the DCR has said. I can tell you what the state police has said relative to safety and security and quality of life. It might be helpful if you mute during, during my response, ma'am, just so you can hear me. Uh, I can tell you that the state police have said if you meet the requirements and do what you're talking about, a, 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 a neighborhood agreement that goes outside the facility, that will be something that would be acceptable to them. So that's kind of the conversation. But I, I just want to, I thought we were 
uh, earlier we had said that we were going to have like everyone have a turn to speak, uh, Madam Chair, one time before people spoke on other questions that they had. I just want to try and move it along so everyone gets to be heard. Thank you. Just, just, just to clarify, it was one speaker at a time, and they had about two minutes or so, not one question per speaker. So, Ms. Hubble, Thank did you. you have any? Thank you very much. Thank you. You I, I, I would like to speak, if I could, uh, regarding the Sea Watch Condo Trust. Um, I represent two entities, at least in town. Sure. Can you please state your name for the record? Yes, this is Paul Cutcliffe. Um, I'm on the Board of Trustees at Sea Watch Condominium Trust, and I also own two units there that I currently rent out. And uh, I just wanted to put the input from the board. Uh, the board members were listening in, but they had to get off the meeting by 7 th uh, 7.15. So Sea Watch is completely opposed to this project. Um, the board of trustees, plus we had signatures submitted to the town uh, to Lori, um, Lori um, West, the um, town clerk. So we just wanted to know. Um, I kind of wanted to know as a trustee there. We can discuss the whole hotel part and being adjacent. But I want. I kind of want to know from the town. Uh, is anybody submit submit and tally up the numbers for the for and the against uh, on this uh, petitions that were going around? To, we have received a number um, of petitions, Mr. Cutliffe. Cliff. I don't know that we've actually tallied um, all that data, and I will say it is likely that there will, will this conversation will be continued. Um, I will turn to the board if they would like to make comments otherwise. But I know that even throughout this this conference call, um, I've been receiving emails and comments, and we want to make sure we take everybody's uh, comments and questions into consideration prior to making it and it's one more thing as a sea watch uh, condominium trust um we have a parking lot there of about 45 spaces and in the summertime we're constantly monitoring the spaces there people are sneaking into the spaces to park there to go to the beach so we are very concerned that people will not have parking at the marijuana facility and sneak into the parking spots at sea watch and uh, walk down to the beach or to the marijuana facility Paul, if you identify one of our clients who does that, they will be trespassed from the property and not allowed to come back. We, sir, we don't have time to monitor Sea Watch. Uh, we don't have cameras outside there. I have cameras in my hotel. Uh, no one has time to monitor <clears throat> their parking lots for their condominium. I'm just saying you 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 put it as a concern that our our patients might do it. I'm letting you know if any of our patients do it, they will not be our clients anymore. So it won't be a repeat, a repeat uh, violation. So, Mr. Linsky, that's not that's not my that's not my responsibility to okay. monitor my parking lot. Your Mr. Cutcliffe, excuse me, Mr. Cutcliffe, if both you and Ms. Linsky wouldn't mind going through the chair, I'd appreciate it. Did you have an additional question, Mr. Cutcliffe? No, I'm also an owner at the um, uh, Ocean Place Condominium Trust also. I also own a unit there, which abuts the property, so I'm, I'm opposed on it on that location as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Thank my name you. is David Citron, and I'm a trustee at Atlantic Hill One. And I would like to know if any studies have been done on property values of um, properties that abut these medical marijuana and production facilities um, and other sites, uh, property values for both residential and commercial. Thank you. So this is Dan Linsky from Kroll. I don't know about specific studies just limited to recreational property values of around a recreational facility. I can tell you that uh, studies of cannabis facilities that were, I'm sorry, of medical facilities, I can tell you that studies of cannabis facilities, including recreational facilities, have shown an increase in property values around the facilities. Crime numbers have gone down uh, and the property values have gone up in areas where these facilities have been located. Danny, I'll take it. Um, there has been studies, the Cato Institute has done some studies and it's just yeah. 2015. Um, there's also a 2019 study found that home values increased $23,000 or more between 2014 and 19 in cities that allow retail cannabis, again, not medical, but we would believe that medical is a um, less impactful use than recreational. So yes, there have been studies done and, and they have shown that uh, values actually go up. Where, where can we get a hold of that information? I can share it with you. Okay, and we'll tell them do their own study. And will the town do their own study on this? Jen, uh, Madam Chair, I could speak to that. Please go ahead, Phil. Um, if the Board of Selectmen uh, were to direct staff 
to um, engage in negotiations um, for a community host agreement, I would request the board, uh, or I'd request, I guess, from the proponents through the board that the proponents would put in place um, a sum of money sufficient for the town to conduct uh, certain studies um, that would help to validate um, the representations made by the applicant as well as to address the concerns that um, residents have expressed. And these types of um, agreements are common, for instance, with large developments. Um, local conservation commissions will often say to proponents that, you know, we need to hire uh, experts that can advise the local conservation commission on a complex application and that the cost for hiring those experts should be borne by the applicant not by the taxpayer um, and it's also done in planning processes and so forth so I, I think that um, in the event the board of selectmen were to direct staff to start the process of negotiating a host agreement one of the first items out of the box um, would be to identify those elements of information that the town would want to either more fully explore or to validate independent of the applicant um, and would have the applicant to supply, uh, supply sufficient funding to accomplish that task. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> okay, do we have any other um... Condo Association representatives on the call that meet. Yeah, yeah Donald Brooker as okay. a trustee. Chief Brooker, if I could, um, we can circle back to you, but I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to speak first. That's fine. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Please. I'm sorry. Did, did yes, Mr. 29 Oceanside Drive in Hull. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. I have a couple of questions. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Lemnios for his uh, description of the legal process that occurs here. But I'd like a few more questions, a few more answers about that. Uh, does the board intend to make a decision tonight? First of all, is one of my questions. Second of all, if the board does make a decision, what would the vote be? Would it be by majority or some other uh, number, such as planning, planning and zoning changes required greater majorities? And finally, uh, if the vote, uh, if the um, board votes in favor of the proposal, uh, I take it then it goes to the planning commission, and then uh, I'm not sure about the process. It's the planning commission then make a report back to the board, and does the board then have an opportunity to negate what it originally proposed, or does it have to um, accept what the planning commission recommends, or um, try to enter into this community agreement. Um, so who, what I'm trying to get at is, who's the ultimate decision maker here? Thank you. Sure, Mr. Yes, um, a couple of points. So the, the planning board is a special permitting authority under the Nantasket Beach Overlay District. Um, so any special permit that may be issued would be issued by the planning board. The board of selectmen could vote by a simple majority um, to enter into negotiations surrounding a, a host community agreement with latitude 42. Um, I will check with the board at the end of this discussion as to whether or not we wish to make that vote tonight. Um, but as I stated earlier, it it may very well be likely that this conversation will be continued so that we are in a, able to take in all the comments and questions um, that we've been receiving even throughout this meeting. And any ultimate licensure for Latitude 42 um, would come from the state. And I will turn to Jim or Phil if, if you'd like to fill in any gaps in that explanation. No, uh, can I talk uh, to? Uh, can I, I be I heard? This is Phil, and um, I guess to augment what the chair said. Um, so it's a multi-part process and there is a collaborative um, a collaboration involved in the process between the board of selectmen and the planning board but clearly the first step of the process is for the board of selectmen to authorize and enter into if, if authorized negotiation for host agreement and um, 
if there is a host agreement that is executed, it then allows the applicant to go to site plan review uh, or special permit uh, process with the planning board. The planning board would take into consideration um, anything in the host agreement that uh, you know could impact the uh, the manner in which the building is redeveloped. But the planning board is typically primarily concerned with things like you know, traffic flow, uh, parking, um, signage, things of the, these nature, this nature. The planning board process is also a public hearing process. So a butters would be notified and a, and a butters is defined by law as a certain number of feet from uh, the facility. Um, but there'd also be publication in the newspaper and so forth. But um, to, I think, answer Mr. Cass's question, um, absent um, the, Board of Selectmen and the applicant entering into a host agreement, then the planning board process cannot commence. Great, thank you, Phil. Mm -hmm. May I ask a question? Um, I'm in a butter, and uh, I had you, you, I'm sorry. Could you please state your name for the record? Stephanie Utanis, Rockland House Road, and um, I'm in a butter. I'm looking at the condos in front of me and your facility, and um, I had many questions, but I'm going to narrow it down to two right now. Um, regarding the DCR and regarding state, the state rules, I guess I would say, um, I've heard that a facility like this should be within 500 feet or more from a playground or a school. Um, what about a family-friendly beach being steps away? That's my first question. Hey, so um, the, the, are there are there Massachusetts restrictions on <clears throat> in Massachusetts? On the Cannabis Control Commission uh, and the Massachusetts state law uh, CMR 501, uh, I think I can't remember the exact, but specifically states 500 feet from the school. So a family friendly beach is sort of like a playground or a school. I'm just concerned about that. Well, it, it doesn't under the under the state law. In fact, in Brookline, they have a medical and recreational facility in the same parking lot as a daycare. Center. Uh, yeah. If I could turn to uh, Attorney Lamke on that question, um, because I know that this, the state regulations does not only specify schools. Um, Jim, do you, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Would you like oh. to add anything about the buffer zone and specific to the the NBOD buffer zone? Yes, under the uh, zoning bylaw that was adopted a few years ago by the town, uh, it, it does set up a, uh, a provision in it that uh, there is a, a buffer zone that a uh, medical marijuana facility uh, or any marijuana establishment should not be sited within a radius of 500 feet from an, from an existing licensed daycare center, a school or a playground dedicated to the primary use by uh, or for uh, children, uh, a facility where the primary use is a video arcade or uh, the Paragon Park uh, carousel. So th there are some qualifications there, but as a general proposition of it being uh, near a, a beach, uh, that does not presently come under the uh, prohibition language of the law it is a concern still um and the other is um rockland house road which i've been many times to the safety officers whatever is a cutoff street right down to your facility and um traffic goes traffic is dangerous there are no sidewalks the traffic is speeding all the time and it will be i believe a cutoff road to your facility so i i did hear i did read somewhere in your proposal i thought about possibly having to make some changes to traffic widening streets um adding traffic lights it seems like a little more than what any of us would expect to be done it's it's almost like too much so i wonder how they would handle that safety issue of increased traffic on what would probably be the main access to your facility. 
Again, Dan Linsky from Crawley in response, we would work with the transportation officials who know traffic and know the town and know the challenges to make sure that anything we're doing is in consort to make sure we're ensuring the best possible safest uh, solution to getting traffic in and out of the area effectively and efficiently while protecting pedestrians. But that's going to be a conversation and a development with the folks on the ground who know the location, know the issues, and know what solutions they would suggest to us from, from their professional as being your, your traffic administrators in your police department. And what about your abutters? I mean, do we have yeah. say of in course. that? Yes, of course. It's, it's part of the special. Absolutely. Thanks, Chief. It's, it's not a part of the special permit process to go through those types of details. Howard Stein, Hudson, the uh, traffic engineers would work with your local um, yeah. public works team, yeah. your local traffic and transportation consultants, other studies that you've done that you know, might outline challenges in that area, pinch points, other things whether or not widening of sidewalks around our facility, otherwise, all things that would include larger conversations with multiple jurisdictions to solve. So that again is- I don't have a problem with product. I do have a, prob a problem with location and the appropriateness of the location. And actually I'll end it on that, but that's really what I have to say. Madam okay. Chair, may I, Jeffrey Sheen, Latitude 42. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Sheen. One of the design uh, elements of our project was to move the front entrance of the building to the parking area side on the right. Uh, and having the community in mind, that would not only allow us to have all of our patients parking on our site, but it would not even allow them, we would recommend that they not even drive down there for access through the front of the building because there is no access. We specifically moved it to the right side of the building so we would have our customers and our patients go to that side. And where would you park the 30 employees? Okay, thank you. Uh, where would you park the 30? I'm sorry. Chairman Carl. Excuse me, just one moment, please. Hi. Um, okay, did, I'm sorry, who was looking to speak? Hi, Tracy. I'd like to speak. Okay, no, excuse me, Mr. Oriel, I will get to you in just a moment. I just wanted to, to stay quick. We're going to try and wrap up this discussion by 8 p.m. Um, I think I heard Ms. Connors, who um, yes. would like to speak, we called on her earlier, and then Mr. Oriel, I will get to your questions. Um, Ms. Connors? Yes, thank you, Chairman Constable. Um, I live at 276 Atlantic Ave. I'm an abutter of the proposed facility. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to let me to speak. I got cut off earlier. I'm a lifelong resident here of Hull. I have known Jeff Shaheen for many decades and know his love for the town. I've watched many developers come for decades and try to bring economic development to Hull without success. The town has constantly rejected proposals without hearing all the facts. I believe this would be a great disservice to the town to not allow this proposal to go through the process. The town desperately needs revenue. The building has, excuse me, Ms. Loss. The building has been vacant and eyesore for decades. We should be welcoming developers and their ideas. The town is starving for economic development. I employ, excuse me, Ms. Voss. I implore the board to keep an open mind and to engage in the negotiation for a host community agreement to allow the project to move forward and for the, pro the proposed project have an open, transparent, and public discussion. discussion excuse me. The town voted by 67% to allow medicinal marijuana. I think we owe it to them to listen to the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Connors. Uh, Mr. Oriel? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, my main concern has to do with the water uh, in the town of Hull. And as a person, a homeowner who in the past two weeks has had two different dirty water problems uh, in my home, I have very much concerns about how much water is going to be used by this new facility. And I'll be uh, just, as I said, I'll be very brief. I would urge the Board of Selectmen to have to make an inquiry with the uh, aquarium water company to determine how much uh, effect
this facility will have upon their water uh, availability. And in fact, uh, if necessary, put a limit on the, as to the number of gallons of use that this facility could use on a per day or per week basis in the event that the aquarium says that they cannot supply enough water to take care of the, the facility as needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Oriel. I was also hoping for a moment to speak. Okay, is that Marsha? Yes. Okay, if you could state your name for the record. Sure, Marsha Ramazuski. I live at 10 Only Street. I believe I'm considered in a butter. Um, I don't normally speak out on matters of public opinion, but I wanted to come tonight to voice my support for approving plans to move forward with establishing the medical marijuana facility in the dilapidated building at the edge of our beautiful beach. I grew up in Hull and I'm old enough to still refer to the building as the old aquarium. Um, admittedly, I have not done extensive research on the matters of safety, environmental consciousness, traffic analysis, which obviously everybody wants assurances on. But that being said, I just wanted to state that I wholeheartedly appreciate the business model of providing a product that offers alternative treatment to those suffering with debilitating pain, mental anguish, as determined by their doctors. And I also appreciate that the owners will be focusing on R&D and offering administrative jobs to our local community, in addition to the long awaited sprucing up of the property. So I support at a minimum going forward to the next step. Um, I feel our support at this juncture not only sends a welcoming message to these entrepreneurs, but to others who might want to look at Hull as a place for a startup business. Um, if we can enter into an agree the agreement to negotiate, which I think was the term that was being used, I just think that um, you know we're sending the right message, and and I think that these um, gentlemen, for the owners of Latitude 42, um, will do their due diligence to address the concerns and the residents that the residents have raised. Hey, your two minutes is um, up. Okay, I I just feel we should go forward. Hi, I would also like to speak. Um, I will take a few more um, comments or questions. Uh, Tessa? Madam Secretary, Thank Jerry you. Manning here. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk either, and I was put on hold. Okay, we will get to you next. Um, Tessa? Okay, back to the uh, can I go ahead and talk? Okay, is this Tessa? Hello, can you hear us? Tessa, thank you. Tessa, thank um, you. My name is Mary Schultz. I live at 7 Y Street. I don't know if you can all hear me. I have a bit of an echo. Uh, yes, if you have an anyway, echo. I just want to thank the opportunity to hear this presentation. I'll just turn it down. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to hear this presentation tonight. I want to be on the record in support of Sean Power and Jeff Shaheen's proposal for 120 Nantasket Avenue. As a mother of four, you can imagine my concern surrounding the safety and security in Hull. Before I had heard the full details of their proposal, I was very afraid myself. But I know Sean and Jeff, they are local residents who care deeply about our community and have enjoyed I'm sorry, employed some of the best experts in their respective fields to ensure that this project is something Hull can be proud of. I'm particularly impressed that they hired former Boston Ch Police Chief Dan Yolinski and Kroll Security, who have decades of experience knowing how to do community policing and securing large, complicated buildings and events. Can I stay there? Um, Madam Secretary, sorry, I'd like to welcoming. speak. Could I, ask I am my... confident uh, he will go above and beyond Madam what the state Chair, requires please. to protect us and our kids. What is most comforting is that they will track every product from seed through sale, knowing exactly who buys what, how much, and when in case in any rare is found in our community. We can track it back to who bought it. I know the state requirements. Sorry, I'm just trying to call it. 
Madam Chair. Include this very strict seed to sale tracking as well as total facility surveillance. <coughs> both inside and out, but the good neighbor agreement for patients and others to sign is a great idea and proves to me they can get our concerns and will be diligent in their enforcement if necessary. The reason we have a regulated industry now in this country is because of the dangers of the illicit market. I am happy to welcome them to open this highly regulated and legalized business in Hull. We need the year round jobs and revenue. We can't say no to everything. The federal government is making it easier every day for more people to operate in this emerging industry. I think it will only benefit our economic development for years to come as it continues to become a more mainstream alternative treatment for patients. Look at Gronk in the NFL. I also very much appreciate Chief Linsky's approach to working with local law enforcement. No one knows policing better than those that have done the job themselves. I think the right thing to do now for our community is to move forward into the special permit process. We can all agree that if they receive a special permit, the town sh should get the benefit from a percentage of their revenue through the host community agreement. And that is all we're talking about today. Thank you for hearing me, Select Board, and I just hope that everything can go through. Thank I would like to be heard, Dave Dunlap. I also would like to be heard also. I also would like to be heard again. Madam Chair, may I speak? I think you're on mute. Jen, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so, okay, it, it going on three hours, I am going to turn to the board to see if there are any final comments. But at this um, point- I would, I, I would like to speak as the largest I, business owner that abuts the, um, the proposed site. Mr. Cutcliffe, thank you. I did hear you. Yeah, I I would like to speak. To nope, I'm sorry. If you could hold your comment right now, I'd appreciate it. I have not um, commented yet as the owner of the fantastic hotel at the beach, ma'am. I understand that. I am going, if you please let me finish. Um, I am going to recommend that we continue this discussion to a later date, either, and I will refer to for a week or two, um, in which case those who did not have an opportunity um, to make a comment or ask a question, we'll then have the first opportunity to do so at that time. So at this time, um, are there any additional comments from the any board member? Uh, I'm a board member of Oceana. Um, I'm sorry, from the board of selectmen. Jen, it's Greg. I would- Go ahead, Greg. echo your sentiments. I think we should plan for the discussion, whether it's a week, two, three weeks away because we have spent a tremendous amount of time and we do need to hear from more people. I would like to push it away. Push it into the Can we make a list of the people who did not get to speak so that you have a list? It's too fragmented. I, I had a question for Attorney Eric. Can I go to the chair? This is Phil. Uh, go ahead, Phil. Uh, uh, first of all, why don't we reschedule for two weeks from tonight that will give staff time to, first of all, collect and, and uh, make available for anybody to look at. Um, you know, there was a question earlier about, you know, how many petitions we received and um, how many folks were for and against. So we can kind of tally all that up. And if people want to submit additional letters of support or opposition or commentary, uh, they can do that over the course of, of the next week. And then the second thing is, is um, if people are intending to speak on the next opportunity this comes up, if they send an email uh, to the Board of Selectmen's office, um, you know, we'll put, we'll create a list. And if they call in that night, the chair will have the list of names and just start working the way through that list. And that way everyone will have a chance to participate um, over the course of either this evening or 
uh, the next meeting and and the chair would start with those folks who have not had an opportunity to comment this evening once those folks are exhausted would get to people who might want to make second or third comments i haven't made a Thank first you. comment sorry phil i think that sounds like a plan hmm. phil phil i had a question for uh town council james lamke if i could make a question to him. who is speaking well, who is this is Paul Cutcliffe from the Intensive Beach Hotel. Mr. Cutcliffe, I thank you for participating. He said and I, I, I didn't participate. He said you, you did. Um, I, I participated as a trustee at Sea Watch Condos, not at my. You're currently out of order. Um, sorry, but if you, you did have an opportunity to speak, we are going to continue the meeting so that speaking. there are additional opportunities. Um, so I hope that you can participate. I don't think it's very fair what you're doing. Okay, I'm sorry that you feel that way, um, but please forward your, your questions um, through us, either via email or please participate. I did that two weeks ago and you never responded, ma'am. I did respond to you. I never uh, received an email from you, ever. Mr. Cutliff, Mr. Mr. Cutliff, yes. we just laid out an opportunity. There will be another public meeting in two I weeks. I never said a word regarding my business located directly across from this facility. No, we, we understand we understand that and you'll have an opportunity in two weeks to speak to that issue. It's just that we've been on this particular topic for three hours and there's other business before the board. It has to be completed this evening. So you know we've had a good three hour conversation and there'll be another conversation in a couple of weeks and you know sign up to be a speaker that evening and address your questions that evening. I'll direct a question to the town council. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Latitude 42. I am going to take just a two minute break. If there are callers on this call that are stepping off, uh, we do have two additional agenda items for this evening. Jen, this is Donna. Could I may have a question? Sure, Donna. Um, could Latitude 42 share their presentation they had tonight with the public? Yes, it's on your website and we will share it again. We just updated them this afternoon with the updated presentation. So, of course. And thank you so much, Madam Chair and the entire board for having us. We appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, two minute recess. Just two minutes. It's Do you have landscapes on the floor? Yeah. Hello. I'm good, thanks, Dan. Okay, do we still have all board members um, on the call? I see Donna. Uh, Dom? Uh, John Riley, are you on the call?
Okay, let me try ask one more time. Do we have um, Domenico on the call? No, do we have John Riley on the call? They may be taking their full two minutes, Jen. They're on three minutes right now. <laughs> okay. Um, Dom, Dom, says, Dom just said he's on. Okay, we can hear you, Dom. I, I just texted John to see if he was still on the call. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Madam Chair, um, there was one also added agenda item. I have um, it. Okay. And then you have a motion, I think, proposed motion for the cable contract as well. Yes. Those are the two remaining. Actually, I take that back. We have three agenda items. Mm -hmm. We do. We do have a quorum. Um, right now, please uh, let us know. Don looks like he's calling back. Okay. Jen, can you hear me? There he is. Um, I can. Who 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 was that? That's Don. Oh, it's Domenico. Oh, okay. We can't hear you. Amen. Okay, great. So we're gonna. I'm gonna move on to our next agenda item, which is renewal of the Comcast cable contract. This is um like i said a cable television renewal license that would be granted to comcast cable communications management and granted by the board of selectmen should we vote in that matter um the renewal term is july 8th 2020 through july 7th 2030 this is a routine renewal do we have a any discussion or a motion i have a motion um, sure. I hereby move that the board, as a cable television license issuing authority, vote as follows. To grant the subject cable television renewal license with an effective date of October 1, 2020, to Comcast Cable Communication Management, LLC. All terms and conditions contained in the renewal license have been agreed to by the Comcast and through its authorized representation shall execute this renewal license, the agreement, as set out on the signature page of the renewal license. Two, to recognize and acknowledge the senior citizen discount letter from Comcast dated July 8, 2020, signed by Comcast Senior Manager of Government and Regulatory Affairs, Michael Gala, and copied to Jerry Berkeley, Senior Director of Government and Regulator and Affairs. So moved. Okay. Second okay. by Seth, though. Okay, second. Any discussion? Okay, I will call for a vote. Uh, Donna, how do you vote? Yes. Greg? Yes. Or I'm sorry, uh, Domenico? Yes. And has John Riley joined the call? Okay, and I am a yes. So by a vote of four, that license is renewed. Thank you, Donna. Our next agenda item is a request from Bill Leonard to install a traffic to, to install traffic control devices on B Street. So the board received a letter, or the town received a letter dated May 17, 2020. Um, requesting the approval to install a rubberized, rubberized speed bump approximately 100 feet from the seawall between homes residing at number 18 and number 19 V Street. Um, just for everyone's reference, the Board of Selectmen are the traffic commissioners for the town, um, but I am going to turn to town manager Le uh, Lemios. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, this is a request from the residents who, this is a dead end portion of V Street that, that runs to the beach. And the police chief has reviewed this request and he has no opposition to the request. 
Okay. Uh, Mad oh, Madam Chair, this is Domenico. Go ahead. Uh, I was actually on V Street over this weekend. I do understand why they're installing it. It is a very narrow street. If someone does pull in, it's difficult to get back out. I would be in full support of this. And Phil, if I do recollect, the gentleman, Mr. Leonard, has also offered to install and remove this annually, correct? So there's no yeah, cost. Uh, they would be temporary and um, only installed in the summer months and then would be removed. Um, uh by october 31st it would be installed may 1st removed by october 31st um in any given year so that the snow plow operations could could uh continue without any problem and they're a rubberized uh product so it's not a it's not like a, a concrete speed bump or anything it's it's a forgiving speed bump but it's just designed to slow people down as they run up that dead end apparently people Think that they can make a left turn or a right turn or something. Okay. And, and just, Madam Chair, with that being said, I would be willing to make a motion to approve the request as presented. Okay, there is a motion. Is there a second? Seconded. Um, any discussion? I, I actually do have a question. Um, Bill, do you know is the, is the intent for the speed bump solely for traffic control, for speed control? That's correct. Have we done this or permitted these elsewhere in town upon reservation? Have, there have been requests in the past, but they tend to be on streets that are through streets, not dead end streets. This is kind of a unique location. Um, it, um, you know, it's a very short street. It's a dead end street. Um, so we've not permitted them on through streets and we've not, to my recollection, had a request for a dead end street. Okay, and is the I'm sorry, is the expense born of the homeowners or the yes. the, the total the cost for procuring the speed bump, installing it to our specification is borne by the homeowners um, on it, and I'm well I'm sure we will have them sign an indemnification agreement as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, um, Domenico, how do you vote? Uh, I vote yes. Greg? Yes. Donna? Yes. And I am a yes. So that passes by a vote of about four. Okay, thank you. And then last and added agenda item is emergency parking regulations renewal. Um, basically, um, the last time you voted, you voted the current emergency park parking regulations through um, July 15th. And since our next meeting um, is scheduled for July 15th, um, I figured we'd get, we'd get it on the agenda. The police chief, both the police chief, I and staff recommend that you keep the current emergency regulations in place until um, you know maybe the week after Labor Day, as opposed to just revisiting them on a monthly basis. There's been um, a good response to them in the sense that um, you know uh, the neighborhoods are less burdened by um, some of the parking that they've experienced in the past um, we've now made the investment in all the temporary signage and so forth and so we would request the board to just extend the emergency ban to um, sometime after labor day this year labor day uh, falls on um, uh the 7th of september so maybe you know extended through september 14th which would be the following weekend okay um, any discussion from the board uh no madam chair i'd be more than happy to make a motion but i have a question sure go ahead uh, adam do you mind holding off on your motion absolutely go ahead Donna. So all of the parking lots are opened now at 100% capacity? Um, the DCR, I believe, is open their large lower lot at full capacity. I'm not sure about the lot that's in between the two lots on the um, HRA. They, there are still uh, cones in place on the angle parking that is directly across from the hotel on the ocean side. And I think they're keeping those in place in order to ensure that people who are walking can adequately distance from themselves um, 
so I think that you know that's the status. The HRA is still at 500 cars, um, and I don't think I think there might have been one day where they approached the 500 car limit, uh, and that's always just dependent on weather. Um, and there are no there is no parking lot that has been approved by the board of selectmen north of the monument. Okay, and have we still been receiving positive feedback from the business owners, helping them? Um, to secure more business with the two hour parking limit and whatever the parking limit is in front of them? Yeah, they, um, we've not heard any negative reports from any of the business owners in, in the Surfside section, the section between Water Street and um, the Dunkin' Donuts stretch. Um, we did receive some kind of frantic calls last week when, the, when some of the traffic cones were removed in front of the businesses on the lower stretch. Uh, because that, they're still utilizing that for takeout and those have been put back in place. We did make a call to DCR and DCR, you know, kind of has restored most of that. Um, I did get a call today from the business owner at the bait shop at the bottom of the hill here, um, concerned about the parking at the gut. And her, what she reported, which was a, you know, kind of an unintended consequence of, of the parking ban, because whenever that you make regulations, there are predicted consequences and often unpredicted consequences. She said she felt that she was losing some business because people would buy bait at her shop. They drive out to the gut, which is a very popular fishing spot. And because of the limited parking time limit at the gut, they couldn't adequately fish. I did indicate to her that a week ago or so, we did open up the big commuter lot for parking again, once the commuter boat started running and that people could park in that commuter lot if they were going to go fishing out at the gut for a longer period of time it's not that many people um and she was very happy with that response um so i think you know as we're kind of addressing it um you know there is some more opportunity for parking i, I would say the one area that we still have kind of a business resident conflict is at the 02045 site the a street marina site um, the residents are very happy with the parking restrictions that are in place. The business feels constrained, um, but it should be noted that the business does have off-site parking uh, available to it. And that even the business representatives said in an email last week that they tried their hardest to direct people to that off-site parking. It's just up the street, but not all of their customers necessarily abide by their advisory. Um, so I think that you know, after we get to the end of the summer and we kind of do do a debrief on this parking configuration and what elements people liked, what elements people didn't like, that's one area that I think is going to deserve special attention. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Do we have a motion? Uh, Jen, yep. Jen, this is Domenico. I'd be willing to make a motion to extend the parking restriction, but I want to go through the end of September, and here's why. Um, September, we do still have our 80 degree days, and you know, if we don't go, if our kids aren't going back to school, it could still be kind of that prolonged summer month. So I would propose that we go at least through September 30th, or maybe we spill over into that first Monday of October, which would be October 5th. I just feel like the mid-September, those last two weeks, we could still see uh, kind of those beach days and kind of uh, that situation that, you know, prompted us to pass this. So I would make a motion uh, if the board is, is inclined to extend the parking restriction until October the 5th. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I would second that. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. How do you vote? Yes. Greg? Yes. Donna? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So the motion passes by a vote of four. Okay, that concludes our agenda for this evening. Is there any old or new business from board members? Uh, Greg? Uh, well, new, there's a park and rec meeting tomorrow night. I won't have anything to report till the, our next meeting, or we're going over phase three and what we can open up. And that's it. Thank you. Donna? I do not have any new business. Thank you. Uh, Domenico? 
Uh, none tonight, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I am all set. I thank everyone for their, their patience uh, during this extended meeting this evening. Um, and I think that's all. Phil, is there anything you'd like to No, I just want to thank um, the police the police department and all of the, the officers, the fire department and their officers and our public works employees who helped once again to kind of ensure that people could enjoy the 4th of July um, and celebrate um, without, um, you know, putting themselves in, in too, too much harm. Um, every year they do a great job of kind of pre-planning and being out there early to make sure that if people are going to celebrate that they do it in a manner that's safe. And um, so it was a beautiful night for people to enjoy and they did. And uh, thankfully we did not have any incidents that were um, uh, of any great uh, risk to the citizens of Hull. All set. Thank you, Phil. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? And before um, I actually entertain a motion, uh, I think we might still have somebody on the line. We're, we're willing to stay on, uh, take a questions for a couple of minutes. That is there a motion to adjourn? So moved by Cessna. Seconded. Thank you. Uh, Dog. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Greg? Yes. Donna? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, motion, uh, excuse me. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jen. And I don't know if there's any uh, press still on. I, th I know that I, I, do, yeah, I, am, I, do. Nope. I think we might oh, have I one. Am. I do. Yeah. Um, hi, Jen. Yeah, it's Carol Meyer from the Hull Times. Um, I just was wondering, was that date, September 30th, that the um, parking restrictions were to be continued to? October 5th. Oh, October 5th. Okay. And then are those, do those include like the non-resident parking and the one hour and the two hour parking that we're talking, is that, are those all included in that? Yes. She said she may take questions. Who's that? She said she may take questions. Oh. See, Gregor, you I can't answer what you're From, it's okay. Go ahead, Carol. <laughs> okay. And then, um, so will the, will the presentation from, um, you know, the marijuana dispensary um, be on? I didn't hear whether it was online or whether it will be online. It will be posted. Uh, there's currently one in line. Latitude 42 updated their slide deck, and I don't know that it is, but I'm certain that it will be posted online uh, okay. tomorrow. Okay. And then was there a date that this was continued to, or will that be determined, the hearing, I mean, the meeting? To be determined. But oh. I think we were okay. saying two weeks. So two weeks yeah. would be the 15th, but well, I mean, the, the chair will look we'll consult tomorrow and it's either going to be it'll be no earlier than the 15th okay and then the only other question i have is um so is there a deadline for comments then i know you said over the next week but um is there a deadline then for comments or people to be on the waiting list for being uh, for asking questions next time as a practical matter people should try to get their comments in as quickly as possible and if they want to speak they should try to identify that as quickly as possible uh, because okay. it just takes time to compile those things and and you know create the list and so forth. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thank okay, you. any other members of the media? Okay, I think we are all set then this evening. Thank you, Phil and Jim. Okay, have a great night, Madam Chair. And we'll uh, I'll end the meeting. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Could be ending. <laughs> I Trying to end. It's spinning. Yeah, so am I.